Are you going to record or you want me to record? I'm recording now. Okay, great. And Wim, I'm going to make you, um, I'll un ask you to unmute and make you a host and you should be able to uh, share your screen. All right, very good. Hi, everybody. Um, I am Wim DeCourt. Um, let me rearrange my screen here for a sec. All right, so um, just to position my part of the session, I will talk about Pharmac and 19, uh, but I will skip over or omit the things that, uh, that other presenters will talk about. Uh, Todd will talk at length about add-ons, which is obviously a big, a big part of what's new in, in the Pharmac and 19 platform. And then next month, we'll have Chris Ippolite, uh, who will do a lot of uh, demos about some of these features that we're talking about, specifically around ML and JavaScript. So I will still talk about these things, but more about the how they work and not so much about just uh, the wow factor of, of demos and stuff like that. So I will leave, I will make sure that there's enough for, for both Todd and, and Chris to, to dive into what, they, uh, what they're talking about. And we, we um, uh, Jonathan mentioned this a little bit. Um, there is a new uh, release cycle to Pharmaca 19, right? So 19 was the last of, of the big ones, if you will, the last of the yearly cycles. Um, so from this point forward, and this was announced back in February, that's in this knowledge base article um, that we're seeing here. Um, they will, uh, they have committed to doing quarterly releases, right? So May um, was the, the one that we've just had. Um, and we're looking at August for, for the next one. So we'll have to see how that shakes out. I mentioned this because it has one big impact on the way that we traditionally deal or handle new, new releases. Like if you're any, anything like what we do, typically when a new version comes out, we, we hold back a little bit and we recommend to our clients to hold back a little bit until there's like a V2, which typically was three months after a release. Um, if Pharmac is going to commit to to quarterly releases, um, that's going to change how we deal with that, right? Because the the next release will not be 19 v2, right? It'll be it'll it'll have both have fixes for whatever is broken in 19 v1 as we know it now, but it will also contain new features, right? So we we don't have that traditional model where there's a big release with many many new features, and then and then some gradual uh, three monthly releases that fixes things. Um, so those fixed things will now be intermingled with, with new releases, right? So we can't really hold back. Well, we can obviously if we want to, but we can't hold back in the traditional sense of saying, well, I'll wait because uh, I know that the features are there and I'll get to those features uh, in the, um, at some point. We'll con continuously have new features. It obviously means different way that we will test these and, and spend some time vetting uh, every new release as it comes around. So, so keep that in mind, that is gonna be um, fairly significant. The good news for that is that in talking to the engineers, um, obviously when, when, the, uh, when the May comes around, like when 19 was released, there was a lot of pressure on them to make sure that, that whatever features were done and baked by the release date. Um, if they have a feature that, that they are not quite certain that, that it's quite fully baked, with these quarterly releases, they have a little more time because it doesn't need to be in, in the next big one, right? It, it, they can be in, in, in the one three months down the road. So, um, so hopefully, I think I'll hope that it translates into um, a little more stability in some of these features. All right, so um, add-ons, like I said, the Todd will dive into that. Uh, JavaScript and add-ons are the two big ones. And I'm just gonna say one thing about add-ons. Uh, in a lot of people's minds, add-ons seem to be linked to JavaScript, and, and they don't have to be, right? Add-ons are not, not necessarily a way to bundle JavaScript functionality uh, in, into your solutions. Add-ons can be pure FileMaker uh, schema objects, right? Maybe, maybe it's your bundle of favorite custom functions. Maybe it's that one thing that you always do when you integrate with an API where you have some generic scripts, an API call log table, uh, maybe custom functions, maybe a layout or two, right? So you can bundle that into an add-on and, and make it a little more transportable or offer it on the marketplace, right? So, so it doesn't need to be tied to JavaScript, these add-ons. Um, and I'll leave the rest to, um, uh, to, uh, to Todd there. Um, a couple of other things before we get into the JavaScript stuff. Uh, operating system-wise, obviously on the Mac, it's the current plus the last one, which means Catalina and Mojave. Uh, and it's been like that for a while. So 
we're, we're kind of used to that. On the Windows side, there's some fairly big changes with this one, right? On the server, and we'll talk about server next month um, in, in a lot more detail, but for server, it means no more server 2012, right? It's 2016 or 2019. Uh, what that means is that if your client is planning a rollout of 19, there may be a bit of a knock-on effect that they also have to upgrade their server versions, the OS, uh, to make this happen. Similarly, on the client side, there's no more support for Windows 7. And there's still plenty of companies out there that are running on Windows 7. And so there, too, may be a bit of a knock-on effect. But probably the single biggest change there is that for Windows, this is the first version that is 64-bit only, right? Uh, Mac OS has been 64-bit uh, only for a while, but on Windows, we've always had the choice between 32-bit and 64-bit. Now, the reason that that is significant mainly has to do with with integrations, like anything that FileMaker needs to interact with uh, on the Windows side. And the big one there obviously is Outlook, right? Um, by default, many Office installations that include Outlook will install in 32-bit mode, even on 64-bit uh, operating systems, right? Um, so, so there too, upgrading or migrating to 19 may have a knock-on effect and the rest of the deployment that, uh, that need to be in lockstep to make sure that 19 can function properly and, and Outlook integration is, um, is a big one. Uh, we have no more runtimes. Runtimes have been deprecated for about five years, I believe since Famica 14. Uh, so in 19, it's been removed. You, uh, you no longer have the ability to create a runtime uh, with, uh, with 19. Um, on Mac, there's a drag and drop install, right? That's, um, you've seen that. I'm sure most all of us have installed 19 at this point. Um, and they've also dropped the moniker advanced from the name. Uh, and that one does have an implication if you're using the get application version anywhere in your solution, it'll now say pro 19 in the string instead of pro advanced 19. So you may have to, um, may have to look at that and play with that a little bit. Uh, one other small thing is the, um, the feature that we've had for a couple of versions that um, the small XML file that dictates what your default fields will be when you create a new table. It creates uh, new fields by default. You can turn it off by, by making that, that XML file blank. I typically have a couple of different versions for different projects that I'm working on. And I kind of actually like the fact that it creates my preferred uh, fields uh, in any new table that I create. Now, you cannot just copy, if you have a modified one, you cannot just copy that one from your 18 into your 19. The XML grammar is different, right? The new one, now uses uh, the updated XML grammar that is also used by the new script stack save as XML, right? So you, where you can save your solution expressed as XML. Um, so this default fields XML uses that same grammar uh, as that one. The changes are not major. If you need to update yours, that there's, there's just a few changes that you need to make there. And, and there's some blog posts in the community that will uh, talk you through that. So that's, that's fine. Um, and by the way, if you do have questions, because we will be jumping between different topics, if you will, when we talk 19, if you do have questions, um, just ask them throughout the session. Don't need to hold them up until the end if it's relevant before we move on to something else. Dina, I saw you're waving there. Yeah, I wasn't sure whether we were supposed to interrupt or not. Um, so I know that Windows 7 is not supported for Famicom Pro, but I was doing some testing and installed it successfully and started using it successfully. So what are the ramifications that you know about, about actually using it on Windows 7? Um, I, I haven't tried it, so I don't know what, what would not work in essence. Um, so it, it's like with most of these things, um, I tend to, because I, I interact with support so, so frequently on, on behalf of clients that, that I, I really don't stray from, from whatever is supported. So, uh, for, so for me, it doesn't even, pay for me to try it and then figure out what, uh, what may be broken. I just won't go there. Okay. And I was just wondering if anyone has any experience, maybe just type it in the chat or something. I'm just curious. Yep. Perfect. All right. So we'll tackle JavaScript because um, JavaScript is obviously the, the big thing or one of the big things that we have in the, in 19 here. Um, and I'll stick to the, more to the fundamentals of these things, right? In the in in future sessions, and especially with starting with Chris and some of the stuff that uh, Todd and Jeremy are doing, uh, they'll they can highlight some of the more advanced stuff. But I want to make sure that we have the fundamentals down as to why I think this is a major game changer in in the way that we will all architect our solutions. Um, 
Now, the ability to use JavaScript in the way that we will uh, see here is not new. Right? We've been able to, we have been able to do this since about Farmaker 14. Um, and at, back at, at, at that time and, and every, uh, ever since then, um, quite a few of us in the community, including uh, Todd and his crew, have been saying that JavaScript is eating the world and, and it, it is going to change. It's going to change fundamentally how we, we look at things. And I think this one um, brings it, lowers the threshold significantly, right? If it's, it's, um, I was going to say we can't really do anything new that is not true. We can do new things. But more importantly, we can do those things that we were able to do before in a much simpler way. And what that means is that more developers will be able to grok it a whole lot more easily and, and look at this and say, yep, I understand what's going on. I can do this, right? Instead of looking at something and say, yeah, I see what's happening, but this is way too complex. There's way too many uh, potholes on that road, and I'm, I'm sure to wreck my car when I go down that street. So I, I think that barrier has been removed uh, in a big, big way, and that's why I think it's a game changer. Uh, back at Soliant, and, and Jeremy can testify to that, Jeremy, when he was at Soliant, uh, was our biggest advocate in that sense. We've been seeing this come, right? The, this, this is not new for us. And, and at Soliant, we've been making noise internally about this for years to the extent that we say now that to be a solid Famica developer, you have to have basic JavaScript skills. It's that important, right? This is how fundamental we think this is to how we make solutions. Um, there's almost no solution out there these days that we would build from scratch that wouldn't have some JavaScript in there. Whether it's data tables or some data visualization that we will use, it will have something in there. Um, that's my big intro. Now, how does it work? Um, let's see. What, it's maybe a little small and I apologize for that, but um, a quick recap of how it was done in the past, right? In the past, um, and we still have to use the web viewer. Let, let's, let's be clear about that. And in the past, you would have, and a web viewer is HTML code, right? It has to be a page, a web page that can load. And in the past, we would have JavaScript in there and the JavaScript would be fired by the act of loading the page in a web viewer, right? That would be the trigger for the JavaScript thing to run. Uh, and I'm talking about the, the simplest form of making this happen. And then when the JavaScript is done and you wanna have your result back, um, you would use something like this, right? Where you would use the FMP URL um, to call back to FileMaker and say, hey, call this script and here's the parameter, here's what the, what the result of my JavaScript function is, right? So uh, uh, if we load this from top to bottom, we have in essence the JavaScript function in here, um, we have this FileMaker variable in there, the input one, that would be the one that our scripts prepares what the JavaScript needs to work with um, so that when, when this one loads in the, um, in the web viewer, uh, it gets, the HTML code basically gets the content of that variable and then can, can work with that. And then the red line is where that JavaScript function gets called um, and it gets the, the input that it needs and it does what it needs to do and then, and then passes the, um, the baton, if you will, to the FMP URL. And that's how it was done in the, in the olden days, if, uh, if we say so, right? Um, the way that we would do the exact same thing right now is we will still have a web viewer. Um, what, I'm, what I have on the left-hand side is just a text field so that I can show what my HTML code would look like, the stuff that I feed to my web viewer. The web viewer is the thing in the middle, right? And the web viewer doesn't have to do anything. It doesn't have to show anything, right? It's just a vehicle uh, that contains the HTML, uh, really the JavaScript, but it has to be wrapped in HTML. But the JavaScript that we need to execute is, uh, has to be loaded in the web viewer. Uh, other than that, it, it doesn't need to serve a purpose. I will come back to that in a sec. But, um, and we have our function, right? That's the JavaScript function that we can call. Um, and we have this new uh, JavaScript function that FileMaker sort of like injects into, um, uh, let's, let's for simplicity's sake, let's call it into JavaScript so that we can call back to FileMaker using this FileMaker perform script which is a JavaScript function that FileMaker has created for us and makes available to us um, so that we can just use it in our JavaScript code and that's how we call back. All right, uh, let's execute that. Um, now, this is how it works as, as, um, as in its simplest form. Now, the way that FileMaker makes that available to us is it's really, we're talking about three different functionalities. There's two that are at the core um, and the most important one is this one. 
knowledge of JavaScript. Right. As a so we have a new script step called perform JavaScript in Web Viewer. And it takes three pieces. First, we have to tell it what Web Viewer uh, holds the JavaScript function that we are going to call. Right? So that's the object name. Then we have to tell it what uh, JavaScript function we're going to call. And that's, that matches the purple thing. Right? That's my JavaScript function name. That's what I, what I put in here. And then we pass it whatever param parameter that we, um, that we want. Uh, in this case, it's going to be a FileMaker variable uh, JSON. Uh, and that gets passed as the input to my uh, JavaScript function there. Right? So that, that's how we call it. So no longer do we need to rely on the fact that the web viewer needs to load and the act of loading executes our JavaScript. The web viewer can sit there and it could have any number of JavaScript functions in there, right? It's basically just a library waiting to be called at that point. As long as the web viewer is there to be called, um, th there's, no, there's no loading that needs to be, well, obviously <laughs> the web viewer has to be finished loading before I can call anything. Uh, and there's, there may be some timing issues. There's some good content in the community around that already. Uh, but in essence, the, the web viewer just contains the JavaScript functions, and then we use the script step in FileMaker to call any one of those functions that we have. So that's, um, that's, the, um, that's the new thing on the FileMaker side that we have. Uh, we can call a JavaScript by name by targeting it at the, uh, at the web viewer. And obviously, the other thing here is the JavaScript function, the FileMaker performs script that will call back to the script that we, um, we name here. There is a third element to this, uh, which is this execute FileMaker data API script step. And we'll spend a little bit time on that, uh, time permitting. Um, the reason that, th that we have this one, it, we can use it for any number of reasons. It's, um, I tend, tend to sort of compare it a little bit to the execute SQL uh, function that we have. Um, this is a way to collect data, right? Uh, from inside FileMaker, we can ask data and we'll get it in JSON format. That's in essence what it does, right? Um, the name of the, of the script step is a little misleading because a lot of people seem to interpret that, that we're actually going to call the data API web service. That is not what's happening here, right? We are calling the data API engine, right? The engine that, that lives inside FileMaker, um, but we're not calling FileMaker server. We're not going outside of pro talk to server to come back in. That's not what happens, right? It is the data API. It is the core of the data, by, data API engine, but we're calling it from inside FileMaker. Uh, so this, this runs even in a local file, right? It, this, does, this does not rely on FileMaker server in any shape or form. And it's meant to query, right? It's meant to ask for data. Um, the documentation on how to create the query, it's sort of like if you, if you compare it to execute SQL, uh, to use it, you have to be somewhat proficient with the SQL syntax. You need to be able to know how to construct your query. Like, what is it that you're asking for? The data API script step is the same, right? And the documentation for that um, is actually the same documentation as the actual data API, right? If you scroll down to, um, uh, to here, perform a find request, this will, will show you how to construct that query. And the query is a bit of, of JSON uh, that contains everything that you wanna do where you say, um, find me all records where a particular field matches this and, and using all the wildcards that you would use for typing. And by the way, when you get the results, sort it for me, right? So all of these things are possible. So the documentation for that is the actual data API uh, documentation that will, uh, will get you there. With one big caveat, right? The actual data API, because the documentation speaks to the actual data API, the one that you talk to server uh, or through server, that one can do a lot more than finding, right? It can create records, it can update records, uh, all of that stuff. You cannot do that with the script step. This script step is exactly like the execute SQL function. It's about retrieving data. It's not about creating data or editing data. That's not possible with this script step. But when you do, when you use it and you, uh, let's see, I have a very simple syntax in its simplest form. It's a little piece of JSON where you point it to a layout because it's context-based. You have to give it a layout to, to use as like, I need data from there and the there is your layout. Um, the layout also means that whatever is on that layout, you'll get back in the, in the data, right? Whether the fields that are on there, the portals that are on there, all of that will be included in your, uh, in, in, your in, in the result in essence. And you could do things like limit and offset and all of these, all those good stuff, the things that are documented in the, uh, 
in the data API. Hey, Wim. All right. Um, Go ahead. Uh, Wim, this is Todd. Um, I'm actually going to show a little bit of that. So um, a little bit of the data API stuff. There's actually a bunch of features that are not documented in the data API um, that that are added to the to the function. And I've got a file which I will I will uh, I will Perfect. share with everybody that has some of the other features that are in it. So we can we'll get into that a little bit in 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 my session. Perfect. Um, with that, I can leave it at that. So in essence, what you get back from the from that script step is JSON in this format, right? Um, which is exactly the same format that you would get if you were to talk to the data API web service uh, on server. Um, so there's a bunch of good stuff in here. Uh, and if I show this example, my JavaScript function will basically receive JSON as an input. It will parse it, and then it will um, it will basically multiply whatever is in the sum number field uh, and multiply whatever the, with the result is. Right. So if I look at uh, simple data. Uh, this is my uh, my record set. So this is my sum number field. So what the JavaScript function will do is it will uh, it will parse through the JSON. If I give it JSON that represents these records, it will go through these uh, same number fields in turn and multi and keep multiplying. So if we have uh, four or five is twenty, eighty uh, times two is one sixty divided by half. So the result that I'm expecting is eighty uh, based on on the data that we have, right? So if I go back in here and I execute this one, I get 80 back as the result, All right? And the script that we, that we just executed is fairly simple. I collect my, my data from here. I call my JavaScript from here. And the JavaScript, uh, in, in turn, uh, does this, which is really simple. Uh, we grab the script parameter, whatever the JavaScript function passed back to us, and we show it in the custom dialog, right? That simple. And that's how powerful it is uh, to use the, that new function. It's the, and that's the, it's in its simplest form, right? All right. Let's go back. Do I have them sorted? I do, right? So this one, the one that we're looking at here, is actually the example that you'll find in the Famica help file. Um, and there's two reasons why you would want to use JavaScript in your solutions. One of them is there's actually a, a lot of reasons, but one of them is to do something UI driven, right? So either it's a data visualization or it's a UI widget, something that FileMaker is natively doesn't, is not really good at, or that you just like better in the way that it's, it's done in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And that's one of those examples, right? Um, so I have a little bit of HTML code that, that basically draws these widgets. I have a name field, a rating slider, and a favorite color picker. Uh, and I have some data here on the lower right, uh, some data that's been set there. So if I load that, um, I basically just called this function, the uh, this one here, and passed it the three pieces of information that are, that are in my FileMaker fields, right? So just by calling that, I, I populated my widget with these things. So now if I change those, Right, and click the submit. This submit will will uh, basically run the blue JavaScript uh, code here, which will basically call back to Famic and say, "Hey, store the data that, that I just have in in my um, in my web viewer here." If I click this, now you see that the data has changed here on the lower right. So that is one uh, one of the big use cases why you would use JavaScript because you want to use that that data visualization widget and all of that good stuff. The other reason that you would want to use it is if you have something like this. Um, that is not that has nothing to do with UI. It has nothing to do with showing stuff. It's basically its only purpose is to leverage the computational power of JavaScript functions, uh, which, in depending on what it is that you want to do, is going to far exceed what you can do with native FAMIC or while functions or, or looped scripts and, and all of that good stuff. Right. So there's plenty of, of things that you can do that you can pass on to JavaScript that are going to be much faster than doing the exact same in FileMaker, and that includes the whole round trip, right? Picking your data, sending it to JavaScript, waiting for the result, and then getting the result back. Um, what we have here is, in essence, a huge chunk of, um, of JSON. It's, a, it's an array. It's a huge array, by the way, and I shouldn't have clicked in that, but there you go. So it's about a million, it's just over a million and a half characters long, right? We're going to pass that to the JavaScript function. Now, the reason that I say it's a million and a half characters it goes to show that there's, I'm sure that there is a limit to the amount of data you can pass into and out of the JavaScript function. 
Um, I've tested this with things like there are 100 million characters and, and it didn't flinch. So I, I stopped trying. Um, I'm, like, I'm sure that there's a limit, but uh, I don't think um, we'll hit it anytime soon. So as far as I know, there's no limit. It's bounded by the yeah. memory of the computer, as far as I can tell. Yep. Which, which is pretty darn fantastic, the, the way that that is done. Um, all right, so let's run this. So the JavaScript function, in case you were reading that in the background, and I'm sure you're all so proficient that you automatically grokked what I was doing in the JavaScript function. This one, this JavaScript function basically parses through the JSON that we feed it, uh, and it extracts um, uh, from the array, and it, it builds a different uh, uh, a string, basically, with, with one element of that huge um, uh, JSON that we had. Uh, the JSON had about 1,900 elements in there, um, and we got this whole thing extracted. The result, uh, this, the length of this string here is just under a million characters, and it did that in eight tenths of a second, right? Uh, just to demonstrate the raw power of the JavaScript engine that we can now leverage, right? So and we're talking about sending it over a million and a half characters, waiting for it to parse through that, and then getting the result back and stored in a FileMaker field, right, in less than a second. Um, I think that's, um, that's quite something. Let's look back at this one. I won't run this one, but this, this one was one of my other tests. This was actually some uh, COVID data uh, broken down by country. And, and as you can see, that one has over 100 million characters in that, uh, in that JSON input. Uh, and what the JavaScript function does is it extracts all the unique countries from, from that thing. Um, it, it did that in, I believe, something like 20 seconds. So it's, it's clearly a lot, a, little, a lot longer than the other one, but still magnitudes faster than anything you can come up with uh, using, I, I was gonna say native Amica stuff. Uh, that, that's not really, that's not how I think of this because JavaScript is there, the web viewer is in FileMaker. For me, JavaScript at this point is just pure native FileMaker stuff. It's that simple, that's how I look at it. Um, this is, I'll, I'll, I'll give you this test file so you can uh, break it down a little bit and, and play with it. Um, this one will basically try and create a string depending on, on uh, how many characters that you ask it to output. And this is, this is what I was used for testing to see if I could break the, uh, the output and then I couldn't. Um, so I gave up after 100 million with this one. All right, so I think I can leave it at that with, uh, with the core concept of why you would use JavaScript. It's gonna be for pure computational stuff or it's gonna be for, for UI stuff. Um, and, and I hope to have demonstrated how simple it is to put it together and, and, the, and the functionality of, of how it works. Now there's a couple of things, um, one that we already mentioned and the second one that I just wanna plant the idea in your mind there uh, to be careful of. Um, if, your, uh, if your HTML code is really long, uh, and, uh, and it would take it a, a while to load there. Like I said in the beginning, there may be a timing issue, right? If you, in your script, you load the web viewer and then you call a JavaScript function like right away, your web viewer may not, not be finished loading by the time you call your JavaScript function. So that's something to be aware of. That's something to obviously test for uh, when you do these things. Um, the other thing is when we look at this function that we have, this FileMaker perform script function. Uh, this is a really simple uh, JavaScript function, right? So there, there's really no scope issues, but um, if your JavaScript function is a lot more complex and you just put in this FileMaker perform script uh, at, and somewhere random, especially if you're not very familiar with JavaScript, you, you may find that it doesn't work because it may be sl slightly out of scope for, for where you are in, in, your, in your code. So, so don't fret if it doesn't quite work the way that you uh, want it to. Um, you're going to be you're going to run into one of those issues. It's going to be a timing issue, or it's going to be a scope issue. Um, that's typically what will bite you, especially in the beginning, as you get uh, proficient with these things. Now, having said all of that, I said that one of the big things and nice things about this is how simple it is. The other big thing is that how well it now works in WebDirect. Right, using this old style, the the way that we have been able to do that in 14. Um, it was doable and you could make it work 
somewhat elegantly in, in FileMaker Pro, it didn't quite work as well when you had to do this from WebDirect, right? This new functionality works just, just fine in WebDirect, right? So it's entirely compatible uh, and you, you shouldn't have any issues when, when you want to uh, use WebDirect for this stuff. All right, any quick questions on that before I move away from JavaScript? Is the data text HTML required anymore as the first line? You mean this one? Correct. Is that required anymore? Uh, I believe it is on Windows. I haven't really. Yeah. I believe it's on Windows. Yep. Um, we, we definitely included it, uh, but it's not, it, it's not needed on Mac. So, but if you, I'm pretty sure it's still required on Windows. For sure, WebDirect. Yeah, and, and WebDirect is another good point. Yep. If you uh, the other question that we have in the chat there is, does it also work on Go? And, and yes, it does. And normally the data uh, the API, other thing, I was gonna say go normally ahead. the data API requires uh, SS, um, uh, an SSL certificate if you're running it locally. I'm assuming that that isn't the case anymore. The data API. Well, here's the thing: you're 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 not talking to any server, so th there's there's no SSL with the script step. That there's your this is a native inside FileMaker kind of thing. You don't go outside of FileMaker uh, to use the script Excellent. step. Um, Excellent. And, and Excellent. that's why I I wish they hadn't named it the way that they named it. But you're not talking to the data API web service. Got it. Uh, SSL certificate would only be necessary if you talk to something else. You're here and you're talking to something else. You're not Got talking it. to something else here. You're just staying within FileMaker and you're telling FileMaker, hey, I know you have this data API engine. Let me, let me borrow it for a sec, right? So Great. you don't go outside. There's no SSL certificate needed. There, there, there was a Thank lot you. of talk about what to name this thing. Um, and we didn't have a lot of time. It didn't get a, a, a huge amount of, time of, of discussion, but it is important to know that it is based on the data API and the documentation is mostly the same. And what's kind of nice about that is that if you're building, say, a UI widget that you want to talk to the FileMaker API, you can actually use essentially the same code, whether or not it's running in a web viewer or whether or not it's running on a custom web publishing and talking through the HTTP server. So um, I, I know it's confusing, but I think it's also important to know that it is actually the same parsing engine that's doing it. Yeah, if anything, it was a lack of, impossible lack of future prediction to name the web service data API, the data API, because it's, it's actually the underlying API that's the same. And it's the fact that it's brokered through a web server in the first implementation we got that makes it confusing. I'll, exactly. I'll have yeah, some more to say about it. If, there. I had a quick yeah, question. My name is Dave. Uh, and you mentioned there could be some timing issues. And so would you use a JavaScript, JavaScript like a ready function to see that the page is properly loaded before you perform your JavaScript to make it all work together? You could, and I'm sure that I will in certain circumstances. In other ones, I'll make it make it so that the web viewer is 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 loaded, so that I know the timing and the sequence of things, so that I put it where it, it has time to load before I actually call it. So, uh, so either or, um, so so yes, you can certainly do that. Uh, it's going to be part of of uh, of making your code robust, right? This is the kind of thing where where you want to take explicit control over what's happening, so that you know that everything is in a proper state before you do something. Okay, thank you. There's some discussion on the FileMaker community sites about different techniques people have used. And my, my experiments, um, the amount of time that it takes to load is something on the order of like one or two milliseconds. And so there, there, you do have to be careful about it. But if you're, under, if you're gonna do something that's triggered by a click event or something, it's not normally gonna be a, a problem. It's just when you're trying to have it initiate on load of the web viewer that it comes into play. I have some, I have some libraries I'll share that have the, have a, have an init function that waits before, waits to see if the, if the, if the file maker object is, is in place before firing. I'll share later. Yep. 
We have a question in the chat there from uh, Caleb to, uh, who asks, is, is authentication skipped for the Execute Pharmaca data API? Um, um, same answer really, because there's really no, uh, if you use, it's a script step that is available within your security bubble, right? If you ask for, if you ask for data that, you, that your privilege set is not entitled to, you'll, you'll, you won't get what, what you expect to do. So it, it is not like perform script on server where you spawn a completely new session somewhere else. This is just within, within, your, within your script runtime, if you will, your script execution, right? So there's really no, no need to re-authenticate or, or there's no different session going on. This is just, it's exactly like what you would get when you have execute SQL. All right. Um, while we're on that there, I don't know, Todd, and uh, feel free to, uh, actually, I don't have this file open. Hold on with me a sec. Um, I did some, I can I guess I can open up that on my server. Uh, I did some preliminary um, performance testing with the data API uh, script step there. I don't know if you're touch on that, uh, Todd, or, or um, if I should skip it. No, go ahead. I'm curious. All right, so this is the same uh, demo file that I used back in like five years ago in uh, a DEF CON session to demonstrate the penalty that Execute SQL has if you have an open record in the target table for the user, right? So we all know the behavior. Uh, if you have an open, if the client has an open record in, this, in, it, in their own session, they're asking, they're running Execute SQL against that table that has the open record, Famica server will download the whole table, right? It's a huge penalty depending on, on the amount of records you have in, in that table. So one of the first things I wanted to do is, is check whether the execute data API script step has the same penalty. And I'm happy to say that it has not, uh, but there's some interesting behavior. Uh, so this is my test file. I have a table with a million and a half records, and then with a smaller one. Uh, it, they, these are fairly narrow tables, right? So, and the reason that I'm saying that is that the, data, the execute data API script step, just like anything in FileMaker really, when you ask for something from a record, you get the whole record, right? whether it's execute SQL or, or bringing it up in, in a form view in, in FileMaker or the execute data API script step, you ask for something from the record, you get the whole record. So if your record is wide, um, that, that may carry a penalty. Um, I, I have fairly narrow tables in my test uh, file here, so bear that in mind. All right, so what, what do we have? Um, I have different sets of buttons. I will only go to the first one. This one, the, this button here will run an ex, a very simple execute SQL against the big table, the one with the million and a half records, right? It'll just say select uh, ID fields from this big table where ID equals 1 million, right? So it's a very, it's a dead simple execute SQL. There's no complexity to it, no joins, no SQL functions, nothing whatsoever. So if I run this and I run this a few times, you can see how much time it takes. And this is a server uh, that I'm in Toronto my server is in AWS uh, US East. Um, so this is, there's a little bit of, of distance, not huge, but a little bit of distance. So you can see how fast execute SQL is. All right. If I do the same with the data API script step, the exact same query, but translate it into, um, into the execute data API script step, you can see that it's, it's slower, right? It's about, uh, what should I call it? 10 times as slow in, the, um, in relative terms. Uh, in absolute terms, do I care? Probably not, right? Unless I do this in so many iterations that the extra time is gonna bite me. In a normal workflow, I probably don't care that, that it is slower, but it is slower. Now, in thinking about this, there, there may be many reasons why it is slower. One of the things that I didn't touch on, and, and I'm sure Todd will, will touch on that, um, if I wanted to do a like for like comparison, I probably should have taken my uh, execute SQL syntax result of that and transformed into JSON, right? Because we get JSON on, on the other side. The other thing that the data API script step does, it actually gives you some, some metadata, stuff that you don't get when you do an execute SQL. So there's a little bit of extra information built in there. And the other thing is because it has to interrogate, for lack of a better term, the layouts to make sure that, that you get what, what's on there. That's not something that execute SQL has to worry about, right? So those could be potential reasons as to why it's, uh, it's a little slower. Um, so what I could do, of course, I can use that same one and throw it at the perform script on server and then run it that way, right? So if I do that, you can see I get about 60 milliseconds in, in my scenario here. So it becomes faster um, than, than doing it client to, client to server like I had in, in my first test. Obviously, big caveat around perform script on server, 
because I see so many developers fall in, into that trap. It is faster for me because I'm the only one on that server right now. If that server is a low-end Mac Mini and you have 50 users, don't count on performance on server always being faster than the client doing that, right? So you're asking the server to do something, the server better have the, re have the resources to do this stuff. Um, so uh, uh, keep that in mind. And again, I can make this file available if you just want to play with that a little bit and, and, uh, and see how I've done that and build your own tests. The, um, the query that I've built here, both on SQL side and the NXU data API side is, is very simple, right? I, I really want to see a little more testing done around complexities added to that query. Like what does it do when you do sorts or, or finds and all of these things. Hey, Wim, you when something? you're doing that yeah. query with execute, with the execute data API, are you doing it with just one field on the layout? You're just your one response? Your, your one field? Uh, on, on this one, layout? I'm pretty sure I do. No, there's actually a, a few on them. Yeah. So, so the other thing you're not, the other thing that's different is in your execute SQL, you're only returning one column. In, perform, in the execute, in the, in the exec data API, you're returning all those columns. That, that right there may account for a big part of your difference. That's a good one. I'll, I'll change the, um, I'll change it to be more like for like and, and see what's, yeah. what's there. And I'll, I'll report back to the FM disk group on that. But I think the, the key takeaway is that um, practically there's not really a, a significant difference, especially if you're targeting JSON, there's probably no real difference between the two in the best of scenarios, right? I would agree. I would agree. There were there were some uh, some people in the community that were sort of like expecting it to be faster because it's newer. Um, and it's one of these things that like let's not make assumptions about these things. It's fairly easy to test and and then figure it out. Right. But uh, um, but it's uh, it's good. And the obvious big benefit of that script step is that you get to J you get JSON right. So you don't have to then uh, transform it or do anything like that. And so and just to, uh, since minutes. we're on this topic, I'll skip it in my when I talk about this a little bit. But they, we looked at using execute. SQL as the step instead of using data API. Um, there are a couple of problems with it. Uh, it it's not going to return the data types correctly um, without extra work. Like you have to, you actually have to do a lot of work to get a number to come back as a number instead of a string um, or uh, that kind of thing. So it actually would it actually would take a lot of work to get execute SQL to return proper JSON. Um, and so that's why it just wasn't really a candidate for what we needed when we were trying to figure this stuff out. There's another interesting behavior there. And I don't know if, if you um, noticed that thought or played with that, but uh, um, I mentioned that the, date, the, the script step doesn't have the penalty that execute SQL has, the one with the open record, right? But it has some interesting behavior when you do have an open record. And the behavior is exactly the same as what you get from get modified fields, right? Uh, so picture this, uh, as a user, you're, you're, are, you are on a record and you haven't committed the record yet, you have an open record and you have modified three fields, right? Your cursor is still in the third field, right? Um, if you if you put get modified fields in your data viewer, you will see two fields listed: the first two, not the third one. The one that that is active, the one that has your cursor, will not be listed in get modified field. Now you don't commit the record, and you use a, a, the execute data API script step to ask for the record that um, that that you're in. You will see that it has the modified data for the first two fields, but not the modified data for the third one, the one that, 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 that your cursor is in, right? So the behavior there is on par with get modified fields, but it's kind of weird because you get a, get a hybrid mix of your, of your changes um, at that point. So that is something that can, get, that can catch you out if you're well, not careful. Well, one of, the, one of the things that might help clarify why that is, is that, is that this is actually making a, a new window to do this query which is why you don't need context. It actually creates a, it actually creates a new window that's hidden. Um, and so that new window would be just like if you're on a record and you're doing the same thing and then you create new record, that's, that's what you're gonna get. That, that field that's not committed is the same thing in that, in that new window. So in fact, the first version of it actually fired all the script triggers and everything um, when it opened that new window. But yeah, so that, that helps explain where you get this behavior is that it actually is functionally opening a new window to do this query. Perfect, thanks. All right, so moving on from there, um, I wanna talk about the, um, 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 the machine learning uh, thing, which is the other big uh, feature. And Chris Hippolyte will do a lot of demos in, in, in his session uh, on that stuff. Um, 
So, and th this is this is Mac only. Right? I want to say Mac only. It means fun, the Final Cut Pro client on Mac OS, but also the iOS clients and the iPad OS. Uh, it actually also works server side. If your if your server is Mac, uh, you can also do this server side. Um, and uh, machine learning is falls under the big umbrella of artificial intelligence. And what it really means is that you, um, uh, in, in order to have a, a model, you 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 basically you want to have an outcome and typically this is about recognizing patterns like if you have text and you want to know what what the expressed sentiment is in that text like is it good or bad or i have a picture and i want to i want to know what objects are in my picture right it's a classification thing uh, so there's diff there's a lot of different reasons why you would build the model now the way that this is implemented in filemaker let's start with that is uh, uh, we have a couple of uh, we have one new script step we have one new function um, the function sorry the script step is this one, configure machine learning model. Uh, and in essence, there's a couple of things, but you point it at uh, the container field that has your model, right? So the model that you have created or somebody else has created for you is a, so it's like, it's a compiled thing, right? It's, it's a file um, and you put it in a container. And then when it's time to, when you want to use that, you have to tell Famic, hey, go grab that model because I'll need it. Uh, and that's what the configure a machine learning script step does. And you have a couple of options. One is to unload it, to say, I'm done with that, clear up the resources that, I, that you just used to, to hold that and make it available to me. That's the unload. Uh, and then you have vision and general. General really is about uh, parsing text. It's about uh, processing text. The vision is about processing images. Um, it's important to note that Famicom's implementation of, of the Apple Core ML is, is a subset, right? It's not every single feature that, that you have available in Core ML that we now have in FileMaker, um, it, it has a subset. So it's, it's processing images or it's processing text. Um, also know that when, when we're talking about machine learning, uh, you cannot make FileMaker learn things, right? That, that's not what it's about. You have your model and the model is defined. Your model will not get smarter by throwing FileMaker data at it. So this is not about training your model. Your model is trained, your model is finished, you're happy with, with the outcome of your model, and then the model gets compiled and stored into a container field. So that, that's in essence what it is. So with the script step, we tell FileMaker, go grab it. This is what I expect, of, uh, what, this is what I expect to do with this model then when we want to execute it, we have this function here called uh, compute model. And actually the, the help file for this one is, is pretty good. So that one will explain some of the options, but you point it to the model that you just uh, told it to configure. In this case, uh, I, I took the text one, but this is text. And then you point it to the text inputs that you want to have processed. In the case of an image, let's go back to this one. Uh, so the same thing, I configure my, my, uh, my model and then my computes uh, will say, hey, here's my model name. It's an image that we're going to process and here's the image that, uh, that I want to do. Uh, there's some additional things that you can pass it. Uh, in this case, you can say, because here's the thing, when you, uh, it's, it's all about probability. Like if you ask it to interpret an image or classify an image, you'll get probabilities. It'll say, I think this may be Todd, but it could be Caleb, right? So, and and it, it'll assign a probability score to that. Um, so uh, you can set your own threshold. You can say, hey, don't give me results that are less than 50%. I don't care, right? Uh, and in case that there's nothing that is over 50%, uh, get me at least one. Like whatever the top uh, score is, give me that one. Um, so in essence, that how these things work. Um, all right, so that's how it works. It's, it's simple, right? You have the model, put it in a container, tell the script step to configure it, uh, and use the compute model uh, function to, uh, to call it. Uh, and that's all well and dandy. Um, so how do you get those models, right? You can, you can find them. Apple has, has a website that has some models. There's, there's no end of models that you can download from GitHub and you can compile yourself and, and all of that good stuff. Um, but this is where, if you run into problems with this, uh, you'll run into problems like this one. Let's go like this one, right? So I have a model called NameDT. And if I run this through the script debugger, The moment that I try to tell Famic, hey, go grab that model and load it for me, you'll get something like this. An error occurred, I, I couldn't load this. Uh, or you get another error that they will say, unsupported input or output parameters, right? So 
what is that about? If you go to uh, one of these models, and this is how you can test these things. Like if you find a model that you think works just fine, um, if you right click it and you open it in Xcode, um, and obviously opening an Xcode, we're not, we're not interested in looking at like the code and like what, what all the fancy stuff is with this, with this model. What we're interested in is the input and output, the stuff that's here at the bottom, right? And the thing to remember is that FileMaker can only deal with outputs that are simple data formats, right? We're talking strings, numbers, that kind of thing. The reason that this one fails is that it outputs, as one of the outputs, it outputs a dictionary. And for FileMaker, that's too complex to, to handle in the current iteration of, of how they've done this machine learning, uh, the compute model or the loading of the model, right? So um, if you get an error like that, when you find a model and you want to use it, this is where you will run into trouble, right? So uh, the best thing to do is then check to, to see whether, whether it has any complexity, either in the input or the output. All right, any questions on that? And Chris will do a lot of demos on this uh, when it's his turn to to talk about that, so I, I won't go into details and into into some of these stuff. But there's some really cool stuff out there um, that you can use. Um, now, there's plenty of web services too that do uh, this kind of thing, right? Uh, the so why would you do one of these? Well, clearly, uh, if you're on Windows, you're kind of stuck uh, because you can't use this. So you would have to use uh, one of the web services. Um, but you would choose this over web service for any number of reasons. One of them would be that you want this to be self-contained, right? You don't want to be making calls to an outside service. Maybe you can't. Maybe you're in a place where there's no connectivity. Um, so that would be one reason. The other reason would be that most of these servers that you're going to call um, have some sort of pricing tiering, right? So uh, if you don't want to spend any money and you can find a model that's free and you happen to be on Mac, this may be a good way that you can do all of this um, without... Um, without having to pay for it in essence, right? Uh, the other thing may be, maybe there's so much data to go through that you don't wanna be sending that across the internet. Maybe there's some confidentiality issues with sending data to somewhere else as well that you say, well, it makes more sense to, to, to create our own model, train our own model and, and create one uh, instead of having to rely on, on some outside service and then having to worry about where my data is stored and all of that good sense, right? So uh, that's a lot of the reasons why, why you would use that. All right, any questions on machine learning? All right, and what else do we have? We have uh, NFC scanning, right? Um, actually, I, I put them away. Uh, NFC is extremely cool technology, and I'll try to wrap this up very quickly. Um, and, and if, NFC is near field communication, right? It means that you have something like this, which is a very simple tag. On this tag are, are basically radio, right? So it has antennas in there. That, that's sort of like one embedded in the sticker or it could be, could be one of those key cards, right? Um, and the way that this works is you have a device that is NFC scanning ready, like your iPhone, right? By virtue of, this, of putting it close to, to where the NFC tag is, this, your device actually powers, sends out a little bit of power that activates the, the antennas in this thing so that they can basically communicate. Uh, and because this one has no power, it can only send small amounts of data over a very short distance, right? So in essence, that, that's how that works. So a lot of iOS, iOS devices, but not all, can scan uh, NFC, right? And the NFC actually, uh, the antenna is, is near the top here. So in FileMaker, we have a new script step that does that for us. Um, yep. And it's this one, configure NFC reading. Uh, if you've ever played with iBeacons or do region monitoring, it's the same kind of script step where you tell FileMaker, or not FileMaker, well, tell FileMaker go, hey, put yourself in the state so that we can scan something. In this case, it's an NFC scan. And the only thing you pass it um, is the script that you want to run when the scan happens. You can set a timeout, the default is 60 seconds. Um, and you can also set it in the mode that it continuously reads instead of just doing one, right? When you do that, this basically, this card slides up from, from your device, right? It basically puts your device in NFC scan mode. Um, and uh, when it's done scanning or it's canceled or it gets an error, uh, it will run the script that you designated, which in this case is ours. And you just grab whatever was returned from the, from the tag. Um, you grab it with the script parameter and, and then you work with that. Now, the thing to keep in mind is that 
you'll get multiple lines back. And again, here the Pharmaca help describes that very, very well. Uh, you'll get at least eight lines of, of something. And some of these lines will be empty, but the first line will tell you whether it was success, whether the user canceled or, or anything like that. And depending on the type of tag, because there's different, uh, different types of tags, uh, it could be a tag with, uh, with a simple text record. It could be one with a URL. Uh, it could be a, a contact record, so things like that. Uh, you'll get different things back. So the thing to remember here, it's not one line of text. It's not whatever is on the tag that you'll get back. You'll need to do some parsing uh, when you want to use that. So be aware of the, of the return syntax there that you get when you, um, when you scan these things. All right. Any questions on NFC scanning? Very well. We have one minute left. Uh, we'll keep the server, and that was the plan anyway, we'll keep the server stuff for, um, for the next session. Uh, one really important thing about server, um, the new feature that we got in Pharmaca Server 18, the data restoration feature, uh, that goes hand in hand with the better, better parallel processing. Uh, it turned out to be troublesome in 18, right? It, it's causing more grief than it solves. Um, in 19, it's still there, but it's turned off by default, right? So when you install Pharmaca Server 19, uh, you still can turn the feature on if you want to, but it's it's off by default, so you don't have to worry about it on the, on new installs. Um, and there's some other uh, good small stuff. The release on the Pharmaca Server side wasn't wasn't huge. Um, but there are some some nifty little things in there that we can uh, we can certainly talk about um, things that we can talk about throttling the data API, uh, the thrift server that sits behind the data API engine. So there's some good stuff that we'll talk about in the next session. So and with that, if there are no more questions, I'll turn it over to Todd. Hey, uh, I have a question, Wim. Have you done any work sure. with the Linux server? Have you gotten that running? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so. For the people who don't know, we are, uh, they've given us a preview of the Pharmaca server for Linux, right? So I think we, we're on the second build that, we, that we've been getting. Um, so it's way too early for any kind of benchmarking, but anecdotally, it seems to be faster than, than the servers on Mac or Windows, uh, or, you are, or requiring fewer resources than, than the other one. So, so it bodes well for, for what we want to do. And, and um, I'll have to tell you, as soon as we have that one for real, um, it, it, it'll be our go-to, right? So, um, in the community and even in, at Alliance, we are already playing with automatically deploying that, uh, scripting that in, in things where we can just push a button and have Pharmaca servers deployed. Um, it, it's going to be great to have it, absolutely. Yeah, it's exciting. Uh, and I, I don't know if I mentioned it before, but this, um, this was the first of a uh, two-feature uh, matinee with with Wim. He's going to be back next month talking about FileMaker Server. So uh, we're going to have the pleasure of his uh, company again. So Wim, thank you very much for for presenting not only today but also uh, next month in advance. Um, yeah, thanks, Wim. Wim, a little housekeeping thing. I actually made you the host. Um, if you don't mind, actually now making me the host again. <laughs> um, that was a little bit of an error on my part. And Todd, are you able to share your screen? Do you have the ability to do that? says I'm um, just host disabled attendee screen sharing. All right, so uh, let's see if I can. Uh, you can probably make him co-host so you don't have to oh, no, your, no. your power. Somewhere you can set uh, attendees can screen share. Yeah, I think we didn't. Steve, uh, <laughs> this is David. It's under the green share screen button. There's a, a possibility okay. to yep. allow others. Yep, one sec. Under advanced sharing options, who can share all participants. Okay, uh, try it again now, Todd. Okay, let me, let's see here. That looks better. All right, let's give this a try here. You guys see my screen? Yep, you're good. All right. Um, thanks, Wim. First of all, that was really great. Um, that was a really great setup. There's a, there's a lot actually happening under the hood. A lot of little things are coming out, some of which is kind of, you know, like in, in this preview mode, like, like the Linux server. And, uh, you know, it seems I think there's a little bit of a, oh my gosh, things are just getting released too early kind of a, an attitude. 
or I'm, I'm hearing that from some people. And, and I, I would just encourage maybe um, keeping an open mind about it. I think it's really awesome that they're releasing this stuff early. And I think what can be a little overwhelming is trying to keep up with all of the things that are new and, uh, and that have all these kind of weird little um, things that aren't quite polished or in preview mode or whatever. So one of the, some of the advice that we're using internally is like, we're not messing with the Linux stuff, not because we don't think it's awesome. And the minute I know that I can spin it up instantly and, and get it done and get it working and it's not a preview, we'll move all of our servers to it. Um, but we're not choosing to bleed in that area. <laughs> we're choosing to bleed in the, in the add-on and JavaScript areas and letting other people um, figure out how to get Linux, um, Linux really working. So I, I would encourage uh, folks to not worry so much about being an expert in all this stuff, especially when it's, when it's in preview. Um, other people will figure this out and, uh, and there'll be better documentation. There'll be official documentation um, and, and things will get smoothed out and you'll be able just to jump on when it becomes interest, when, you know, when it, when it's reached that point. If you do want to get involved in the edge stuff, then um, pick something that's interesting. Like if, if you're into servers, pick the Linux stuff, do that. That would be, be great to have people, um, people working on that and, and um, figuring that stuff out. If you're interested in JavaScript stuff, then there's a ton of things you can do here. And, uh, but also if you're just interested in, in add-ons, there's a ton we can do here. And that's what I want to talk about today. So the, the, the language of Omic is using is the open platform release. And I think that's a, uh, that's pretty good. Um, kind of tells what's going on. And let's just drop right in and do a demo real quick. Um, so this is to me what is so awesome about this. So this, right now, these are these are some add-ons. Um, some of them, the, the, so this is day back from Seed Code, and we're going to play with that a little bit later. And these are some add-ons that we've been building. And we've got these nice icons. We've got these previews happening over here, right? We've got links to the vendors. Now, for those of you who aren't vendors, you're thinking, what do I care? Well, the, the, the primary problem that vendors have had in this, in, this, in this community is exposure. And we need a really thriving ecosystem. We need people to find the best tools and to buy the best tools or to support the best tools in whatever, in whatever form that is. Maybe if it's an open source thing by contributing to it. So we now have, we now have the beginnings of discoverability. Of, of things that we can add to our applications right within the application. And that to me is, is pretty awesome. So I'm gonna choose this, uh, this simple calendar, um, which some of you have already seen. And we're gonna look at, uh, if we get time, we'll do some, we'll do look at day back in a little bit. But first of all, um, now I've made these icons. These are, this is the calendar that we built um, for Claris and they're finalizing and doing the things they need to do on it. So this will be shipped at some point, at least that's the plan. Um, this will be shipped at some point, so everybody will get this installed in the app itself. Um, we'll go over how to install these in a little bit. But just to kind of make the point, right, this is the experience we get now, right? This is the game changer because for, this is why this is the open platform release because for the first time, third parties can get into layout mode and then it can add tools that are instantly available and instantly work within the environment, within the application. There's no need... There's not a bunch of manual install steps and connecting things up and, and all that stuff. It just works, right? Um, and so this is, this is a full uh, JavaScript-based calendar, a drag and drop. This is based on a popular open source framework called Full Calendar. You'll be seeing this all over the place. Just about everybody who's getting into this is building a calendar. So you'll see hundreds of these, I'm sure. Um, uh, but this is, the one, uh, this is the one that we put together. And um, we can double click and open up. Now this, there's what's cool, is this is a FileMaker layout. This is not JavaScript. This card window here is on top of the web viewer. So what this means is we've left the, we've left the experience, of, you know, this calendar here is in the hands of the developer. So the developer who makes this add-on deals with getting the JavaScript ready and packaging all that up and making this experience so you get the drag and drop stuff. But what happens when you double click it is now back in the hands of a FileMaker developer. So although I know uh, Wim said, and lots of people, and I've said for a long time, JavaScript is an important part of the FileMaker ecosystem. What add-ons mean is that you don't actually have to know JavaScript to be able to use and get the benefits of JavaScript being a native part of, of the application. 
So, um, so we've got a configurator here where we can change some of the, uh, some of the settings for this. And one of the things we can do is, so um, this, let's, actually, let's look at what happened when we installed that. So um, when we installed that, we got these two tables came in and we got some custom functions, we got some scripts, we got some layouts. So a bunch of schema was brought into the system when I installed it, when we clicked the install button. Now, the cool thing is, is that you can go in here and you can actually uninstall it. And you can, it gives you a warning here, it's gonna delete everything. But if you uninstall it, and go back to the database, those tables are gone. Those scripts are gone, right? The custom functions, everything's gone that was brought in with that, with that add-on. So you can try things out and just delete them and they're gonna be gone. Um, so that is pretty darn cool. So let's go back and install it. So first, this action here is, the, is when we're installing it. So when we click an add-on and we install it, that is bringing in the schema. And then we get this drag on group. Now, um, you'll find, we'll look at these a little bit later. You don't always need something to drag on, but you're definitely gonna get this and we'll look at how that's done in a bit. But you drag this on and now this is, this is what we call the drag on event or the drag event. And there's some things that can happen here and I'll point you at some documentation in a little bit as to some of the details and we'll look at some of it um, in a little bit more detail a little bit later. But there are some things that happen when you drag on, um, you can create relationships Two things, although that is, um, I, it's not baked fully, I think, yet. But um, in this case, we didn't mean to make any relationships, so it's just going to work. Now, this is running off the sample data that came in. I also have another table in here called My Events, which is another um, events table with different fields and, and some different data in it. And um, I've just thrown some buttons on it, um, making my own detail layout. And if I want, I can now... I can now, uh, I can change the table that I'm using here. So this is events display. That was the one that came in with the drag on or the, with the installation. Now I'm gonna pick that layout called my events. And now it's gonna tell me I gotta fix a bunch of things. So I'm gonna fix primary key. I'm gonna fix a title field. We're gonna use summary, start date. And you notice we're getting all of the, we're getting the dates filtered by the types that they are. So we've got some ways to do that, and I'll go into that in a little bit. Start time, uh, end date, and end time. So these are the required fields, the things you need to make a calendar work. There's some optional fields. We'll choose notes for this tool tip. We'll say it's an all day event. We'll say it's editable, and we'll pick the style field for a style. There's a few other things which I won't get into, um, and we'll just save that. And now, this is now using the other table. Okay, so this is not the table that came in. This was the table that was in my solution. So if you've already got an events table, you were able to create an experience where you can very easily reconfigure this add-on to point at your table. Does that make sense? So, yes. um, so I, I think that what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make here, I think is super cool, uh, just to reiterate, is that we get this, we get layout mode is now available for developers to do things, right? Um, and it wasn't before. And you don't necessarily need to be a JavaScript developer to get the benefits of JavaScript now being a core and supported part of the platform. So building on what Wim said earlier, we could do some of these things before, never really worked on WebDirect and it wasn't supported. So I started doing some of this JavaScript stuff with FileMaker Go when it first shipped because Go is actually easier to make the JavaScript stuff work. But every version FileMaker, something would change and it would break. And I have to redo the integrations because it wasn't supported. These were all hacks. So the JavaScript integration that we have in FileMaker today is not a hack. This is supported behavior that FileMaker is committed to keeping running and to building on and improving. All right. So I'm going to go back to, hopefully that was a big bang and everybody was super excited about that. That was a big bang. <laughs> So um, I just want to I just want to reiterate uh, the points I've made. So we're getting into layout mode now. So we're finally able to really leverage other people's work. Um, you know, this was kind of we tried to do modular FileMaker. I think we did a pretty good job with what was available. We have some pretty good conventions for building module-like code, but this is really the first thing that's 
that is beginning to resemble a true module. We can install it, we can uninstall it. Um, so that, that is pretty awesome. And so now we can start assembling things instead of building everything from scratch. So you no longer have to build some of these components, you can just install them. So we can get back to doing the differentiated heavy lifting for our customer instead of the undifferentiated heavy lifting for our customers. You don't need to make a calendar. There'll be dozens of calendars. Um, some will be free, some will be supported and commercial, and they'll have extra benefits and there'll be, there'll be good reasons to buy those, those commercial calendars. And now you can spend the time building the logic and the stuff that's really important for that particular client. So um, I do want to say, so this stuff is in preview. Uh, it's rough around the edges, um, but just Wim hit on this. And I, I really think that for those of us who've been in this community for a long time, this is going to take some adjusting to. We are used to, you know, we're, we're just adjusted to the one-year releases. It used to be that they were like, you know, two years. And we got features. We had to live with those features for two years. It's not the case anymore. We're going to be getting at least for a year. And um, it's likely that there'll be, I mean, it could be more. They're basically going to release things as they become ready. Um, and so we don't have to, we don't, we don't have to say like, for, and by the way, the way that we're building add-ons today is not the way you're going to be building them in a year. They're, they're going to be improved. They're going to be changed. They're going to be different. Um, and this is part of the reason why it's still in preview. We're figuring this stuff out. We don't have it like really the, the exact or the best way to do this yet. But so just be, be a little patient and be a little, um, be a little, um, just be aware that this is really, we're dealing with a different company now than we were just a few years ago. Um, the entire C-suite is new at FileMaker. There's none of the C-level execs from just a couple years ago are there anymore. Most of the VPs are new, right? There's new people here. This is not the same. This is, a, you really got to start to think of this as a different company. The motivations and the ambitions of this company today are not the motivations are different than the motivations and the ambitions of this company two, three, four, five years ago. So um, you really kind of have to say what happened in the past is just not what's how what things are going to happen going forward. So one example of that is this is this collaboration that we did with Claris. So um, so Claris hired uh, us and and also iSolutions to work on a couple of things. Um, some of which are still not even released yet. Um, that that especially Chris's team worked on um, and they're coming soon. And some of it was this add-ons, this add-on stuff. We spent about six months working uh, very closely with the PMs and the engineers um, at, at FileMaker. So this was not an ETS type experience of, of, you know, post a bug, wait three weeks to get a response. This was weekly, sometimes daily collaboration with the engineers and the PMs on what's working, what's not working, right? So much, much tighter, um, a much, much tighter feedback cycle that we were able to do because of this, of this new collaboration. So let me talk specifically about the add-on requirements that we had, because you may have different add-on requirements. So this is, it's important to understand why we made the decisions we did and why some of the assets that we've released are targeted towards these requirements. Um, and they may not be the same ones that you decide to target. And so you'll have to, um, ours were actually pretty strict. So we had to do a lot of things that if you're just playing around or learning um, or, just, or just doing stuff like for your own clients, you're just going to be able to drag in stuff really easily. You may not have to deal with some of the things that we did, but this is the kind of stuff that we had to do, de deal with. So our add-ons had to be self-booting. So what that means is no scripts to start them up. When you put them on the layout, you go into browse mode, they have to work. So that, that, that means you're not loading an add-on with a, with a script. You're not loading the add-on with a script step. It's the calculation in the web viewer that had to boot up the thing and make it work. And so that's why if we look back at that calendar that we were just looking at, um, that's what you see here, right? This is, there's no script running that, that boots this calendar. It boots itself. Okay. Um, a part of the reason for that is the stuff that's coming. You've heard the, the words around authoring in the web. You've seen this, this stuff that's been released in, the, in their marketing. That stuff's real and it's happening. And it changes so, sort of some of the experience of first getting started with FileMaker. Um, and so uh, it really was important that this had to work in those new environments. So that's, that's why that, that's done that way. We also had to deal with internationalization, which was a, a big pain, but I learned some fun things there. Um, you may not, if you're only dealing with English or Spanish or whatever, you don't need to really worry about that. We also had to run on all platforms. And although it's much better, there's still issues. 
Windows is still a problem. WebDirect is still, the behavior is not exactly the same. Um, so it's a little bit more challenging if you want to support all those platforms. You're going to have to go a little bit deeper. I also had to work offline, which you may not care about. You may not need to work with a, with a, with a, with a FileMaker Go app. Um, but uh, yeah, and so then, um, so the add-ons that we built were we wanted to showcase JavaScript. So to, to sort of get on with Wim's point there as well is that, um, let me go, let me, I'll, I'll skip around a little bit. So add-ons are not JavaScript, right? And so Wim made that point. I just really want to hammer that home. We're going to look next at an add-on that's not JavaScript at all. Um, and so I think this will get more powerful too as the time goes on. But right now, um, what you can do with just FileMaker stuff is, uh, I think it's still very useful. I think people are going to do amazing things with it. But you're not going to get like the, you know, the full whiz bang that you get with JavaScript stuff, but it will still be very cool. Um, the other thing, so getting back to why we chose, why we chose the path that we chose. Um, so we went with, with React.js, which is a front-end JavaScript framework to build all of these add-ons. If you're not familiar with React, some of the stuff that you download and see that we made available may be a little, just may look weird to you. And, and um, that's, that's true. An important thing to note is that you don't need to do this. You don't need to use React to make JavaScript widgets. You don't need to use React to make JavaScript trans, uh, you know, compilation things like, like Wim was showing. But React solved a lot of problems for us and that's why you're gonna see it as part of the add-ons that we release and part of what gets released in these early stages. Um, number one, it handled transpilation. So this is the issue where um, Internet Explorer is a problem cross-platform. So we are writing modern JavaScript and that JavaScript React will handle, the React framework we're using, uh, Create React app will handle transpiling that down to code that will run inside of Internet Explorer and also does the bundling and also inlining and we can make it into this one big blob which we can shove into a field. Um, the other thing I'll say about, Re about React is that um, it, it, the um, FileMaker's future looks like it's going to be moved. Uh, for, frankly, a lot of the web is moving in, in the React direction. It's not to say there aren't great other great frameworks. Vue's great, Svelte's great, there are other great frameworks. And you can certainly do this with vanilla JS, but there were just a lot of reasons why we chose to go with React. And, and um, well, one of them is that FileMaker is, looks to be investing in that direction as well. Let me stop there and just take a, any, any questions on what we've seen so far, what I've said so far. I can't see everybody. So if, you're, if you have a question, just unmute and ask. I saw a demo the other day about uh, the number of characters you can actually fit into the uh, yeah, insert calculation. Yeah. Is that going to be changed in a future version, you think, so that it doesn't require that uh, bottleneck? Yeah. So um, that, that in, by, by the way, that is only a UI constraint. If you use um, base elements to make a clipboard um, script step of the insert uh, text, script step, it'll take as many characters as you want to slam in there. So it's just a bottleneck in the UI. We discussed that as actually being the way to do payloads. We abandoned it for a number of reasons. One of which is that future versions of this technology uh, will have a better way to store assets. Um, so there wasn't um, just, they've, they've already well down the road of figuring out how best to store things like JavaScript and HTML in ways that can be updated and all these other things. So that stuff that's going on behind the scenes, they didn't want to mess with that. Um, so right now we're storing everything inside of a table. And let me, let me actually, that's, that's a good segue. Um, let, me, let me just show that in that file we were just looking at there. So in the, in the tables that get added, um, so all the ones that we worked on are going to have an, an add-on, an add-on table that comes in and it's got a bunch of fields in it. Um, everyone's going to have HTML and that's the, that is the completely inline version. It's to take all the code that makes up a web page and put it into a single ball of text and that's what's going to be in there. And then the config store is um, when you open up a configurator like this, um, you can actually save different configurations for different add-ons within your system. So I could go to a different layout and I could create a different configuration um, using different tables or different, um, you know, other settings, different starts on days, whatever. And those are stored in that, in that database. Again, the, the, the 
definitely there's, there is ongoing work on what is the best way to handle it because this is not a great way. Um, right now, if you go in and you delete this table, if somebody goes in and deletes this add-on table, the add-on's just done. It's not going to work. The add-on's broken. Um, if you clone the file, the add-on is broken. So there's definitely some issues with this. And like I said, this is, these, are, these are initial, um, uh, and, and by the way, let me just be very clear on that. The add-ons that we built that are using this, the full stuff I just talked about and this table, they're not going to work if you clone the file. And again, this is because of the constraints we had how to develop all this stuff. Um, you could certainly develop add-ons that don't break when you clone the file if you don't store anything in tables. Um, so, um, so I hope that's clear. It's a little bit, I think it's a little confusing though. I think it's like, well, where do we put all these things? And I think the, the answer right now is there's not a, there's not a blessed way of doing it. You will see the stuff that, um, that we release and the stuff that I think Claris will eventually release um, will be based on what I've just shown, but that doesn't mean that somebody might come up with a better way. And certainly FileMaker is going to come up with another way to store this stuff. Any more questions there? Hey Todd, this is Caleb. Hey, I, Caleb. Uh, hey Todd. Um, you know, you had a great podcast, you and Jeremy and Chris uh, from May 26th about yeah. this topic. I just thought I'd call it out for everybody else who hasn't heard it because you go into a lot of depth in that uh, episode and it really explains a lot of this stuff really well, as well as your work with Claris on this. Yeah. Yeah, that we've, we've been covering it on the podcast a lot. If you haven't um, checked out the Context podcast, we're going into pretty deep depths on all this stuff as well there. So it's definitely good. Thanks, Caleb. Anybody else have any comments about sort of where we're at with this? Um, I just back? a question. I noticed when you went to add it, it, it had a nice little folder basically or grouping of Geist Interactive add-ons. Yeah. So, I don't know whether that will survive. <laughs> okay. So we've kind of co-opted. I'll talk about that in a minute where that stuff is currently. Um, I okay. don't think that's how they imagined the category. It's a category is what it's called. Okay. I don't think that's how they imagined category being used. <laughs> I think they, well, they meant like calendars they or, you know, photo editors or things like that. But um, I don't know. It's uh, uh, that was actually John Sindler's idea. You can see if we go, he's got um, the day back one here. Right. Um, yeah. But in, I mean, if you're going to be, if people are creating their own that are not through an official marketplace, yeah. the category is up to the, yeah. to, to the designer. So if it's, if, once it comes to some kind of online marketplace where they vet them, they might have more control over what, what the category is. But if you're getting them by downloading them off a third party website and installing them yourself, that category can be whatever the developer wants. Yeah. I think there's, there's going to be, have to be something. I mean, eventually you're going to get some kind of, certified developer thing because you could you can you could foresee somebody just co-opting our category or whatever our if there's a, a brand name in there they're gonna have to bet this for an official store at some point um, and, uh, i don't think you mentioned yet installing an add-on are you going to cover just yeah. where, where yeah. it goes and all yeah. that yeah we're going to build one from scratch or not from scratch but close cool yeah actually it wouldn't be bad for them to have it sorted by vendor or sorted by uh plug-in name yeah yeah, I think there'll be, I think, like I said, the whole marketplace experience is going to be very different. And um, uh, we'll, we'll, there's still a lot of work to be done there. The current marketplace is better looking, but frankly, it's still a, still a tremendous problem for finding things that are, that are valuable there. And, and uh, so hopefully we can, we can get that cleaned up. And eventually they'll, they'll get all this stuff into an official store. And uh, that's why I think this is really great because, um, you know, when I started learning WordPress, the first thing I did was go to the WordPress install plugins page and started searching and finding all this stuff. And so this is in-app discovery of, of add-ons that will be, some will be free, some will be commercial. That's just so totally cool. Yeah, and in this version of the product, they're only what you statically have in your local yeah. environment, but right. you can easily imagine this being um, connected to the online environment. That's right, and that's certainly the long-term goal there, is to have that up with ratings and all the stuff that, that, that you need to do this well. And, and along those lines, Todd, there's a question in the chat about um, modifying add-ons. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one thing that's not done um, now. So you can't modify. So it definitely let, there are certain types of add-ons that work pretty well now. Ones that uninstall and de re install and uninstall easily are, are definitely those. Uh, ones that you want to keep updated aren't. So I think Wim brought up custom functions and 
uh, I think custom functions, I, I just don't know what you gain over a copy and paste at this point with custom functions because there's no updating um, and there's nothing to drag on. So there's no real change. There's no, uh, except for discoverability, uh, if they ever get there, there's no real change to what you can do currently by just copying and pasting. And, uh, and you know, uh, it's kind of a, and you can't deinstall custom functions. Like, so um, add-ons that, just have like, you know, layouts or scripts that you go call that you go to. You can on, you could just, when it's time to update, you could just deinstall it, you know, remove it, get the new version and install that and then reconnect your stuff and you're good. But a custom function, something you're going to be using all over the place. If you, if you, if you remove it, it's, it's going to break all that code. You can't fix it. So until we get uh, the ability to update add on libraries, I don't know that custom functions are a good candidate, but maybe somebody can prove me wrong. Um, and and it, I know it's a separate topic, but there is the custom app upgrade tool. Yeah, yeah. Is there any applicability of that to up, using that to update add-ons? So, I mean, this is, so the, the app upgrade tool is another thing that's released very early. Um, I'm not, you can, there's very limited things you can do with it right now. Um, the, but they, this is, again, part of what they're working on here. It'll be part of the same technology that goes into updating add-ons. Um, one of the reasons why we chose to use an HTML payload in a field was that this would be easy to upgrade, update if we needed to. Um, and you know, you could, there could be JavaScript um, libraries that are built that have security issues and you need, they need to be updated. So this gives us the option to have simple installers. Like you can imagine a really easy file, you download a file and it just, it'll just send the right data over to your file, the, you know, the new payload over into that field here, right? So there's, um, there's auto updating that you can do if it's in this field, um, where if it's in the script step, there's nothing you can do currently. If you're using insert text to load your payload, there's nothing you can do to update that automatically. So that was one of the reasons we chose a field to do that. And that's also, by the way, um, what Dayback does. Um, they have all their stuff and they've always done it that way and it, and it allows them to do automatic, their, their solution once installed just automatically updates. All right, I'm going to move along because I got to cover a few things and I want to get back to, I want to actually get into some of the weeds here. So let me just run through a couple of other, uh, a couple of other add-ons here. Let's go with one that is not a, um, a file maker. This is one we're going to actually, let's do, let's do the Stripe one first. So, so um, simple file, uh, there's nothing in here but the default table and no scripts, no layouts, just nothing, right? So let's pull Stripe. So this is an example of something I think that works really well. So you grab Stripe, you can bring it in. Um, you can drag it on, bloop, right? Um, it gives you a little info, you can load test card data. Charge card, it's gonna say, hey, you need to enter your Stripe key. So it's gonna take me to where I would put in my Stripe key and then, and then it will work. You enter your Stripe key, this will just work, right? That's pretty awesome. That's, that's and there's really, there's not much to this, not much to this, um, to this add-on, but it took a while to get right, right? So you have to do, so there's a bunch of scripts that get brought in here, right? The Stripe API add-on module. Now, this is using some of our work we've done on this HTTP script, which has been, by the way, if those of you who don't know about our HTTP script, um, this HTTP script has been run millions and millions of times. It's how we run all of our API requests, all of our clients run API requests, and many, many other people who've adopted this script use it. Uh, and it's uh, just an abstraction over the curl stuff so you don't have to write curl to do insert from url and it's we have a test suite it works great so you'll see this um, all over our code but you know figuring out how to do the how to do the, the this isn't super hard to do like you could do this you could make it available and somebody could paste it copy and paste if they know how to paste things in the right order they can do all that but this just works that's just it and then i decide oh you know what we're not using stripe using paypal i can just go into my file and just, um, actually, let's see what happens if it deletes this. I don't know what will happen if it deletes this table. Let's find out. Install. Boom. Goes back to the default, right? That's pretty sweet, right? So let's do another one here. Let's do, oh, here's a nice easy one. So this is an editor. Drag out an edit rich text editor. It's going to say, hey, um, 
we need uh, we need a we need a text field to bind this sucker to. So what are we going to do? Um, so I don't have one yet. So let me add a text field to this file. Normally you probably have a text field in your demo table in the file you're bringing it into. So this is my HTML text create and um, um, I'm gonna let's see. Yeah, so this has to be on the layout to configure it. So we just have to put it, we have to put that text field on the layout and our configuration, our configurator will just read that and pick it up and then we can select it. All right, there it goes. And there's some optional things, other features, All right? Um, but now, oh, interesting. I think you canceled Todd instead of saving. Did I cancel? I think no, I didn't. I did, thank you. There it goes. So it's writing to that field, All right? So, you know, just simple binding it to the, to a field. A lot of these add-ons, a lot of JavaScript stuff is binding it to one field, color pickers, date pickers, things like that. You're binding it to one field. So, um, uh, so yeah, so the add-on, um, again, we can just, we can just remove it. Um, let's see, let me look at my slides here real quick. 1134, I wanna make sure we have time for, I'm not gonna show the photo editor. Let's do Kanban real quick. Since we've got it here, it's nice and pretty. This is one that Jeremy worked on. Yay. <laughs> cards, card files. So again, running off the demo data, right? You can, you can drag these around. I mean, how long have we wanted this, right? Boom. You can configure it, change a different table, um, do your lane setup. What do you want to do for lanes? All these settings here. Whether you want the, the tags, uh, the cards draggable. So we tried to expose a bunch of things. Um, and then the last one, let me, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do. Hey, Todd, can you explain yeah. the, um, the uh, anchoring issues with different objects? Yes, good. That's, oh, thank you. Good, good one to bring up. So let me, let me, um, I know it happens with calendars. So let me do that because I'm sure, whoops. Let me, um, sure that calendar has an issue here. So, um, so, you know, if you don't have anything expanding on your layout, you get this behavior, right? So if you currently, and this is again, sort of one of those areas that's not very polished. If we bring in the calendar, install it and drag it on and we don't have an expanding layout this drag on event is actually smart enough to know hey you're not you don't have a drag you don't have an expanding layout so it's not actually going to expand and if you add it later it won't it won't have picked that up right so if we add expand do something like this um So you see, it's not expanding, right? Now I could go in and change this. It's, it's all here, the, the things there, and I could go in and, and do that. But the thing is, is if you're dragging on an add-on that you want expand behavior and the add-on supports it, make sure your layout already expands. Good one? That's a great tip. I, I just thought it didn't support expanding. I didn't realize you could. No, yeah. Obviously, that's a little, you know kind of wonky. There, there really should be a checkbox that you want this layout to expand instead of what we do, which is put, um, put a little thing on every layout and, and anchor it all around. Um, but that, that, that's how you do it. So once it's there, now if I drag it on, it'll work. Now it expands. Okay. So you have, have that off object there with the, with the movement settings before, before you yep. drag um, Your layout needs to expand before you can get right. an add-on on there that will expand. So what you did was you, you checked the lock. You clicked the lock and unlocked the right side. What, I'm sorry, what was the question? These are locked. If I went in here and did that? Yeah, how did you get it to expand? Oh, um, so expanding a layout, expanding a layout, this is like one of those silly tricks. 
we do it on every layout. First thing we do is we create this little object, we call it expand, and we anchor it to all four corners. Oh. We do that on every layout. If that's not there, well, this, this one, because this add-on was dragged in when it was there, this one's now expanding. That's just the rule for FileMaker layouts. If there's expanding objects on the layout, the layout expands. If there isn't, it doesn't. That's worth right. the price of admission right there, huh? Totally, because if you, if you, uh, define, your add -on, if you de define your draggable, if you define your custom add-on to be expanding, yep. it, it apparently doesn't work. Uh, it apparently loses its expansion, expansion right. settings if you, if you don't know that. That's right. I didn't know that, I just found exactly that out. Right. I was today. Jerry, can we have that covered in our documentation, yeah? Uh, no, too, but I will make sure it's yeah, in there. Yeah. <laughs> I've forgotten about that. <laughs> it's too bad that like dragging, a, like doing that expand thing first and then dragging a portal doesn't automatically expand the portal as well. Yeah, yeah, that would be nice if it was already expanding. If it were an add-on portal, that might yep. work actually. So I'm going to test that out. Yeah, it might. Um, okay, so I'm going to move a little bit quickly now to go through some of these other things. Uh, okay. Just quickly. Um, yeah. She has her hand up. She's been very patiently. Oh, who, I'm sorry. I don't see everybody. So, um, Todd, uh, how does this relate? I mean, the new capabilities uh, to Widget Studio. Widget. Yeah. So <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> um, so Widget Studio, of course, everything works as it always does. And in fact, you could still use Widget Studio today to build add-ons and widgets and use all the new technology, and it'll work perfectly. I mean, uh, so Widget Studio still works. Um, it um, uh, it doesn't produce an add-on, which we, but you could, you could build it that way, put it in your solution, and then build an add-on from that. Um, so it's kind of like a precursor to where we are here. Um, and uh, we haven't really fully decided what to do with Widget Studio. It definitely came from a time before this drag-on was possible, right? Right. So getting, getting things into a file without having to say, okay, copy this step and then copy this step and then copy this step and then do this. That was what Widget Studio was all about, giving us a consistent way of getting code into a file. Um, so that was its, one I of its big- I the inheritance, the, the evolution of the process and everything. Just wondering, yeah. if, should I maintain it for older versions of FileMaker that my clients still have or should I just abandon everything and go to 19? Well, it'll still work in 19. Everything will work just fine in 19. So you don't need to worry. The Widget Studio, once your code was in with Widget Studio, it, it's no longer dependent on Widget Studio. Right. So Widget Studio was, was, it had a couple of things. It was a configuration, a great configuration tool and a great deployment tool, right? The deployment has been solved by add-ons. So that right. part with the, the dragging in really handles the deployment pretty well. Configuration still not maybe... Um, solved all the way, but we're working on it. And so it's just kind of in this, it's an earlier technology um, that uh, a big part of it, a big part of its value or some part of its value was, was obsoleted by, by being able to drag in things. Uh, there's one other thing Thank you. besides those two that uh, Widget Studio is implicitly in which Carafe is also, which is a, a, a unified so like single bundle format. So it, it makes it makes a package something that is a single file that can be transported around. So yeah. we're, we'll actually be we're still kind of ironing out the kinks, but we're releasing an add-on based Carafe installer, which will still be compatible with Widget Studio bundles and with Carafe bundles. Um, so if if you have if you you know that that'll be uh, that'll be something to keep an eye out for, but. I think so, there's still an argument for that. There, there is. And, you know, to, you know, to, to be clear, Widget Studio as a commercial product has a price, you know, and, and so Craft doesn't. And, and so there's a, there's a lot more um, when, when something like this happens and you, you lose a big chunk of the value on that commercial product, it doesn't mean that the value of the tool itself goes away. It's just like, gosh, well, what do we do with this thing, you know, really, in terms of charging money for it? And, you know, we're, I mean, uh, talk to Carson about it and we're still, we're just kind of waiting to see what happens. We don't really know what we're going to, what the future brings there, but if there's a way forward, we'll bring it forward. Um, but right. I, I think the other thing that's really important to understand about all this stuff is that these are early days. This is not the end. This is the beginning. Like, I don't know what other people are going to do. I don't know what, I don't know what, you know, what craft may invent around making add-ons. We don't know what FileMaker exactly is going to do down the road. 
in terms of how these things get embedded in solutions, what the marketplace looks like. There's just so much up in the air right now um, that it's hard to know, like ex it's hard to know exactly what a, a final solution is going to be. I just don't think there is one. I think there are ways to make this work. Um, Carafe is one, Widget Studio is another. We have another one, which I'll show at the end of this, um, that if you're using React, is pretty compelling um, to build add-ons. Um, and there'll be others, other people will invent them. That's part of, we're at, we're at the stage where we need like a thousand flowers to bloom. We're not at the stage where we need to consolidate and, and bring everything down together because we just don't know, we don't know what that, what that point is going to be yet. Um, but that said, again, there's a couple things to, 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 to point out here. Add-ons, like we said before, add-ons are not JavaScript and JavaScript is not add-ons. You can make a JavaScript application, uh, a widget that works great and is not an add-on. There's nothing tying those two implicitly together. Add-ons are a deployment and eventually will be a configuration and updating mechanism. What's in that bundle is, is irrelevant. Like it can be anything. So you, if you're making JavaScript stuff, you don't need to make an add-on. It's not a requirement. Does that, does that make sense? I say that. I can't see your faces, so I can't tell if anybody's going, no, it doesn't. Yes. <laughs> That's one thing we really lose here is I just can't see everybody. I don't know how everybody's doing. Um, but hopefully, hopefully that's making some sense there. Hey, Todd, do you have examples of some add-ons you've seen that are non-JavaScript? Yes. Okay. I'm going to show, gonna show one in a, couple, in a minute. Okay. Uh, well, well, first of all, that Stripe one, there's no JavaScript in that Stripe one. I just showed. Great. Thanks. Stripe was not. And we're going to look at another one. First, I want to do, I want to make sure I show this because I think it's just like, I think, so obviously there's lots of great stuff people are going to create that'll be for free and it'll be useful. Um, but my take is frankly, there'll be so much free stuff that um, uh, it'll be really, it'll, there, there's, it's going to be hard to differentiate a free thing. So um, in order, there, there, will, there will be things that rise to the top and there will be, and some of those will be commercial. I think that's really important that we get both of those things. You want commercial apps in this space. I mean, if you look at, if you look at the WordPress ecosystem, in the beginning, everything was free. Um, we still use some free plugins, but the plugins that we use that run our e-commerce, those are not free. We're not running our e-commerce store on free WordPress plugins. We're paying every year for those plugins. And we do that for a reason because we want continual updates and support. So what I think is happening here is we're at the beginnings of this, but the value in these things is not gonna be getting them into the solution. That's gonna be easy. We've already seen, Wim did some simple stuff. We've seen the add-ons. It's gonna be easy to get things connected. What's gonna be more of a challenge is building up a, a sustainable, you know, supportable thing that builds value over time. That's gonna be more difficult. So I wanna show an example of, um, of somebody that's already done this really, and they just announced this. You guys may have seen some of the stuff on this already. Let me, um, let me go. Great stuff, Todd. What's that? Great stuff. Oh, thank you. Um, so let's look at Dayback here, because this is super cool. Um, and again, just because it's such a polished application, and it already works great as an add-on. It's just such a great job. So Dayback's been in, I mean, John's been building Calendar since 2003. Dayback as a JavaScript thing has been in, been in the market for, for years. It's also in the Salesforce market, so it's really, really well supported. And, and just beautifully done. So Dayback Calendar, let's install it. And um, this one takes a little bit of time. I think it's just the number of records that are getting brought in. Um, a database update, ah, that's interesting. I don't think, I don't think I've seen that dialogue. There it goes. So Dayback is, is interesting because it doesn't have anything you drag on. I mean, it does, but wait to see what happens here. It just says, congratulations, you've installed it. Now go to the Dayback layout. Now, let's see. Um, I've already got an account, so I can just go in here. Let me pull up my one password. So they've effectively worked around the expanding layout issue that we were just talking about. By well, because they not, they're not using the group. They're actually installing a full layout. Exactly. So they're making right. a home layout that obviously has expansion already. So the thing they drag out is just like a business card, just a calling card. Right. 
right? It's not, it's not the app itself. The app itself lives elsewhere. And if it's a full screen app like this is, that's fine, right? You're not embedding Dayback Calendar on another layout. You're using it. Oh. There's a character after .com on your email. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I had issues with my password here before. No, I've screwed it up. Um, Hang on, let me, let me stop my screen share for a minute and I'll get the password because I know what it is. That's so weird. I don't know what's happening in my one password there. Todd, are you saying this is beta also, Dayback? No, Dayback is not beta. Dayback's been in market forever. I mean, I mean the add-on. Well, so the, 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 the add-on is just a, a trial of how to install it. You can install it with or without the add-on. Um, it doesn't matter. Uh, but I but think it's available now, right? Tom? Yeah. 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 They're making it. Oh, so there it is. The calendar's in, right? <laughs> I mean, I've already got all the things. Um, and they have a ton of stuff. I mean, this is a really robust, a really robust solution. So this is what I mean by there'll be a lot of calendars. What people will do is create calendars with extra value. And that's where you'll see things like Dayback, which has these really interesting views, like the horizon view and um you know, this kind of thing that you're not going to see in your standard full calendar knockoffs or the, or the two-week calendar knockoff. And they also have, uh, they have like, um, let's see, administrator settings. You can do all these other sources, Basecamp, Office 365, all this stuff. And it all just works now. It's in your solution. Oh, you don't want to, you don't want to use it. You want to get rid of it. Okay, that's fine. Go to layout mode, uninstall. That is amazing. It's gone now, right? It's gone. No more, no more is in the solution. That is super cool. So that's where I think we're headed. I think we're going to see really well done commercial solutions that have a lot of built-in support for things other than just a drag and drop calendar, because frankly, a drag and drop calendar is easy. Somebody with two weeks of JavaScript training can put a drag and drop calendar into a FileMaker layout today. Um, so that's going to, there's going to be lots of them. People are going to make custom ones. They're going to have fun with it and they should, people should play. They should do all kinds of things. But eventually, you're going to want things that, are, that have extra value in them. And, and so there will be commercial solutions as well. And um, yeah, so, okay. So let me go, let's see. What I want to do now is let's do the, another, another really simple one. Snack bar. So snack bar is just a little button. If I double click it. It says, place this off screen to the right. And then it's got this button on it. I can click to get more mess info. So let me just do that and uh, go see. So it says, okay, here's how we set it up. We put the little snack bar button off to the side. And now here's some buttons that run scripts. They're examples about how to use this thing. Well, I don't even know what it does. So let's find out. Let's take a button. Well, we can just do it here. So we'll just press success. And there's my little add on, beautiful, right? Warning, right? Little, these are called these are called snack snacks or snack bars or toasts, depending on which UI framework you're using, right? So now I can I can copy this button to and put it on my other layout if I want on any layout that I want to run my snack bar. Did I not copy it? No, you just copied text. Well, there you go. That explains it. So let's get the success one. Let me go back to my demo layout. So any, any layout that I want to have a little snack bar alerts, I just put this off to the side. And then this script in here will tell me what I need to do to trigger that. So obviously I'm just running a button. We'll look at what it does in a second, right? So that's that. If I look at the script, it says guys snack example. So I go look at this guy snack example. Here it is. I'm just creating some JSON title message type, right? Calling a script and notice I'm calling it by name. So this is something to think about now. If you're delivering an add-on where you want to give people scripts to call, tell them to call it by name. And the reason is, is that if somebody wants to uninstall and reinstall this, this reference won't break because your script name will be the same. So if you, if you call this script from a list, that would be a hard reference. And if you uninstall the add-on and then reinstall it later, like let's say you want to get an update, this link won't work. It'll be broken. 
So if you call by name, it'll work. Make sense? So another tip is just think about using indirection more because the, the ability to uninstall and uh, reinstall add-ons might be important. So if you can use indirection, calling things by name instead of by hard-coded reference, do that and, uh, and you'll be better off. Um, all right, I'm gonna stop there and ask for questions. Hey Todd, just for people who haven't played with add-ons yet, yep. you wanna just show where you have to put that file so that it- Yeah, I'm gonna, that's gonna be the next thing. Okay. I'm gonna show that. So no questions yet. Okay, great. So let's get to what we're gonna do now is we're gonna look at the snacker, little snacky bar here thing. And um, I think this has admin, uh, So here is all of the code for our little add-on. Got it in the folder. We use a naming convention. We prefix all of our, every piece of code that has as part of the add-on, we prefix it. And that's so that we can visually organize it. It will be uninstalled because it's managed internally, but we prefix everything. And especially that matters if you're calling things by name, you wanna use names that are unique. And so that's what we're doing here. Um, and we've got our, we've got an example and we've got our, Layout here. Now this layout is named, this layout name is important. It has to be named this and with an underscore of, I mean, I wanted to try to zoom that up a little bit here. Um, I don't know if I can, let's see if I can get my zoom to work on zoom. There we go. So this is, this is key. And then EN is the English, is the, is the language tag. So you can actually create multiple layouts for different languages if you wanted to do support for multiple languages. And so you create a different layout named this with a different suffix for each language, okay? That's the first thing you gotta know. The next thing you gotta know is that the layouts, the objects that you want to be your drag on group have to be grouped. So even though this is just one button, I have it inside a group. So it's inside a group of one, which is actually hard to do. You gotta make an extra group, an extra object group it, then delete that other thing and you'll get a group with just one thing in it. Um, but it has to be grouped. Uh, and anything else in the layout is ignored. So just this group, okay? Um, and then there's, let's see, do I have that in here anywhere? I may have to open up a different one to show that part, but... Um, I'm trying to think, maybe in my scripts, script, no, in the buttons. No, it's not in the buttons. Where would I have done it here? Maybe, well, I might have to open up another one. I'll get to that in a minute. So um, once you have that built that way, there's some other things you can do to deal with relationships and making relationships to a schema that's already in the file. Um, where Jeremy's just about to publish a blog post on that that goes through that in detail of what works and what doesn't work. It's frankly, um, I mean, it sort of works, but it's, 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 it's pretty rough. Um, so um, we don't, we don't, we're not building any add-ons that require making a relationship to a pre-existing table. So I'm going to ignore that. Once you've got that in place, um, once you've got your, your group, and we, we basically just bundled up everything else in namespaces. So we've got um, like in the layouts, we've got inside a folder. This not required, we just do it. Um, there's no custom functions here, but there could be. The next thing we do is I put this in, a, in another file um, because I just want to have one place to do this. There's a script step called save as copy on, save copy as add on package. And this is what you call. And you can see I'm using the window name here that I'm storing. And the reason I can do that is so that I can build my add ons just by refreshing this guy and then clicking install add-ons. And so this will, this will work on any window. It doesn't work within the file. It works on the window. So I have one utility file that I use to make all of my packages. You could put this in the file if you want. The problem is, is if you put this script step in here, it gets delivered. There's no way to not deliver schema that's in the file, except well, for things that are on the layouts, the things that are on this layout. Yeah, that's what we have done is just attached it to a, a button on this layout. Yeah, that, that's, that, that would work too. Yeah, that's another way to do it. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, yeah, so you can get away with some of those simple things. And that's it. So let's run that. Let's see what happens. So it actually just did it. It generated all this stuff and it put it in this folder path. So it's library, application support, file maker, extensions, add-on modules. That's where it goes. So if we look at, I've got a shortcut to that right here. These are all of the packages that I've installed manually. So if somebody gives you an add-on and say, hey, put this on, put this, you know, and you want to install this, you got to put this into your, into this place on, on your computer. This is it's only very required for when you are installing it. Once it's in the file, it doesn't care about this anymore. Make sense? Jeremiah, did you have a comment on that? I was just going to, as a tip, it's very close to where plugins get installed. That's right. So if you go to, into preferences in the plugins tab, it, it says reveal plugins folder that can get you cause it, it actually isn't a hidden folder. So um, if you go to plugins, it'll, it'll get you sort of the way there, you know, depending if you. Yeah. If you build an add on, it will open the, it opens the folder for you. So like when we, when we, I didn't open this folder when it, when I clicked this button, it actually opened it. Boom. So now you can see where it is. So Todd, could you put this into a container field in a FileMaker file, give someone the FileMaker file and export field contents? Yep, you sure could. So you can use the FileMaker file. Well, let's see, it's gotta be, not exactly, because you gotta, you can't put a folder in a container field, right? And there's a folder full of things in here. Right. It can't be zipped up either. You'd have right? to have a zip and then you'd have to unzip it. You need like base elements or something like that. Right. That's how you Has anybody it. tried, um, Installing base elements as an add-on. Oh, a plugin. Um, yeah, put packaging up the installer for for base elements in a. I think I mean you can install base elements from anywhere, so it'd be pretty easy to do that. Um, uh, you, it should work if it's in a container field. It will come in with the package, because all the data in this file comes in too. By the way, so that's why we put in sample data. Make sense. Um, there are other, there's another thing. Let me open up, let me open up, um, I realized that I wanted to show one more thing that's not there. Let me pull it open on, uh, da, 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 da. I just want to use, um, hmm. Oh, you know what? I, I know where I can do this. I know I have something else that can work. So I'm working on a new add-on. Let me show you where that is. Um, let me show you um, where that one is. It's called FMW. There's one more important thing here. Here it is. So I'm working on this photo editor. So Here's the layout I'm building. This is where I'm building the, the app itself. And there's a couple of things that are important to know about, about this. So this tag here, you can see this, this um, funky looking thing looks like kind of like a merge token. Well, in fact it is. And what this is, what this, anywhere that you put this on this layout payload. So that means inside a button parameter and inside a, lay, a web viewer calc, um, um, inside anything that comes in on the drag, the drag on event. So this event of pulling it onto the layout. When you do that, that tag will be replaced by a UUID, that tag will be replaced by a UUID. So what that means is, so every time you drag in the calendar or a photo editor, you're gonna get a new UUID in that. So what this allows you to do is to have a unique ID for any of the code that gets plopped in this layout. So we use it here to look up the config. So every config, um, you can see we're getting this um, config object. We get the add-on UUID. Then we have a custom function which looks up the config using that add-on UUID. So this, this tag replacement system is a way to uniquely identify each instance of a particular add-on on the layout. So if you need it as a script parameter because you want to target a specific add-on, because like we have some examples with the charts where you might have two or three versions of this, two or three charts, the same exact add-on, but configured differently on the same layout. So how do you distinguish between those? 
right? And so that's what this replacement tag can do. So, and you probably got it in your object name as well. It's in the object name, exactly right. So in the layout object name for this, uh, sorry, for the web viewer, see we've got it here. So that's how we target with that perform JavaScript in web viewer because we know the UUID because we can get it from a button or from the web viewer itself. We can then target the specific web viewer based on that. And that lets us target more than one on each layout. So looking back at one of our other add-ons, let's do that real quick and just see what that looks like. And then I've got just enough time to cover exec data API. A few other things I want to cover. Um, so let me just pull in the calendar here so you can see that. Oops, I dragged on Snacky again. Calendar. So you can see right in there. See that? So every piece of code that came in on that drag gets the same UUID. I don't know if we use it in here. I'm trying to think of what other buttons we have it in. Yeah, right here. Hey, Todd, you have it in all the event buttons. The yeah, see? Forward, backwards. So every one of those buttons had that replacement tag in it and it all got replaced with the same UUID. So this button, this button now knows that this is the web viewer it's bound to. Obviously this is hacky. I mean, obviously this is not, obviously you want some kind of containment you want scripts to know what um, layout, what add-on they're a part of, um, but we don't have that containment currently. We have this, this kind of methodology of being able to tie the two together by doing that in, um, right? See, there's the same add-on UUID. So that's fairly confusing. So let me make sure everybody gets that. Any questions on that part? Yeah, I was curious actually, when, when FileMaker, when you go to remove the add-on, yeah. FileMaker knows about all the objects that were yeah. So at some level, it's tracking. It is. That's not exposed. But it's not surfaced. Yeah. yeah. I was asking to Dave Ramsey about that. And he was yeah. like, there's nothing indicating that, like that FM perception can show that this object was part of the add-on. It's up That's to right. then to put in this UUID and you'd have to do that. That's what right. Now, now we, they, I haven't looked carefully enough at the new XML. There are some new features in there where they might be tagging every element with a unique tag that they can use. I just haven't tracked it down yet. But that's, that's the scope of the add-on ad overall when you install the add-on. This UUID is the scope of just the element you dragged on and it gets right. regenerated every time I drag that's right. it on the drag. That's right. So this is how we differentiate between different configs of the same add-on. They're all identified by that UUID. And this is how everything kind of knows where, what it's tied to. So if you're doing anything where you've got multiple objects talking to each other and you need to target them, like with the web viewer calling a web viewer, you need to target it by that web viewer name. You're going to need to use this. You need, need to use this atom replacement. If you were to relate to that, if you relate to that table that you created the calendar table and then delete the add on the undelete is kind of broken right now. The undelete for, for what? If you oh, go if, to, if yeah. you make relationships to it. Yes. Yeah. 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 There's still, Question. there's still issues to work out there for sure. Yeah. So my mind is, my uh, uh, this is Dina trying to get in. <laughs> Hi Dina. When you go to uh, uninstall uh, an add on though, is it uninstalling just the one instance or is it no, an the whole thing? Yeah. Every one of them. Yeah. So deleting it, just this instance is just selecting it and deleting it. Right. That's just a, a layout object group. Right. I think you could expect that at some point in the future, this object that gets dragged on will be opaque. You won't be able to see inside it. But I'll right, drag on, try to drag on another calendar add-on. Well, it'll work. It'll work. Just have different UUID. And then delete, the, uninstall the add-on, and I assume both of the instances will be yeah. deleted. Yeah, they'll both delete. Yeah, you can't really see it there, but it's got different. You can see different add-on UUIDs, right? And then when you uninstall, boink, all gone. Pretty nifty, huh? 
So um, let me cover a couple of other things that are, I think are, are important once you get further into wanting to do all this stuff. Um, the first one is, uh, where'd it go? Exec data API, here it is. So this is a file actually Clay Mackle made. Um, I did the new theme on it, but he sent me this file. So this has all of the different syntax, some of which is not in any documentation anywhere. So this is all, except we have this on our blog, right, Jeremy? That's right. Yeah, we have it on our blog, but it's not, it's not in the, it's not in the REST data API. It's only, only available in our blog. Again, this is preview features. Um, part, and the, so part of our responsibility, uh, part of what we signed up to do was to, was to make this stuff widely available. And that's why we continue to be dumping out information as soon as we can get it done. So we're not, the intent is not for us to hoard this info. We, we've released everything that we can. We've gotten permission to release. It's all been released through our blog or through ETS or in other ways. So other, other folks have had access to this information. It's not, it's not just us. Um, but this one is not, I don't think people have gotten into what you can do here. So you can get, um, you can get more information with these metadata things. So you can, there's another action called metadata and you can get back uh, layout metadata, including the table. So this is actually really important. There's no way to get the table, the base table of a layout that's somewhere over there. You can't get it. Um, because there just isn't any way you there, you can use a design function will only get you the names of the fields on the layout. And if the field is native to that is part of that base table, it doesn't give you the table name. So this is actually one of the reasons why we got this function was we really needed to be able to say, Hey, I want to tie this calendar to that layout and I need to know the table name, but there's no way to get the table name. So that was part of why we got these, uh, this metadata stuff. Um, added to this. So there's that. Um, uh, you get uh, all tables also. So you can get your, um, your base, uh, the base table, as well as the name of the TO. Um, specific layout metadata. And th again, this is the format and this is the result that you get back, um, including portal metadata. And there's specific tables. So you can actually, this is the first time well, you could get this with execute SQL. You could get this data, execute SQL. If you knew the base table, you could get the fields. Um, but this gives you another way to do that. Uh, just by, with the um, specific table metadata, you now get all of the field metadata as well for that table. So um, why this is important and why I think, so people often ask, why do I care about metadata? Why do I care about what all these things are? Anybody want to take a stab at why that's important in this new environment? Jason in, Jason out. Well, there's that, but what, what would I be using this for? I kind of already gave this away, but it's sort of the new world we're in now. And so this is in, thinking about this in this way is kind of important. Oh gosh, I'm almost out of time. Um, so I'll just say, <laughs> so when you're pulling an add-on into a solution, it doesn't know anything about where it's at. It has to be able to learn things about where it is. It has to be able to inspect, um, like to be able to build those configurators where you can pick the names of tables and layouts and things like that. Um, it, ha it might have to do. It might have to do validation. Like, oh, hey, is that is that count is that calendar date field that you selected? Is it actually a date field? Right. Like, if you're going to be building things that have to work in environments that you didn't build, in other words, with tables that you didn't design you have to be able to inspect the current environment to know something about where that stuff is and to be able to build UIs, tell people configure things or to validate things. That's why it's, that's why it's important. Do these new properties only work on the perform data API or are they, yes, they do the not work in the rest API. Okay. Um, last thing I want to do real quick is I want to, um, point out um, my widge. So I don't know if there's anybody who does any React stuff in the crowd, but if you are, this part is really for you. So um, we created a, uh, um, a starter kit for building add-ons with React. And if you start by just opening up. So I'm in a, a text editor, I'm in my terminal below, I'm inside this folder. 
and I'm just going to go npx create React app, and I'm going to do that. That will tell me to use this current folder as the name of my project, and then I'm going to go dash dash template, and I'm going to do fmw for FileMaker widget. And what this is going to do is bootstrap. This this is the bootstrap that we used to build all of the add-ons that we gave to Claris. Was was this exact thing, and what it's doing is it's downloading. Um, all of the code and um, a sample file, uh, a, a base file that you can use to start building your add-on. And it's got a couple of other features we're showing off in there about how to fetch data and um, some other things. So um, I don't know if there's anybody that, that's using React out there, but if, you, if you're into React, if you started looking at it, then this will be a big help because this just kind of gets you, it gets you everything you need to build the entire thing basically, except for that last, save as add-on step after that. Um, uh, um, you still have to do that part, but everything else is, is done for you. You just have to write your, your React code and you're good to go. Um, and so some of the things that we've abstracted here are not React specific. And the, the most important one is we have a drop-in replacement for fetch, which is how web apps um, communicate normally with data databases is by making an HTTP request like they would through the REST data API and, um, uh, and then returning back that data. So we don't, from the low level tools that we got from FileMaker, the web viewer can call FileMaker with a script and then the script has to call back to the web viewer to give it the results. So that's the low level stuff. We wrap that with exactly the same semantics as you would get if you were building HTTP. So you would say fetch, but instead of from an endpoint, you fetch from a FileMaker script. Now, if that FileMaker script follows a few conventions, you'll get a promise. It's asynchronous. You'll get a promise back that will have the data that that script um, ends with. So that's how we do the things like, um, like when that widget boots up. When the calendar boots, there's no script triggering. The calendar just boots and the, the calendar starts up and the calendar makes a fetch call to get the data. And that works because that, that's the way it has to work because the calendar has navigation for going back and forward to the dates and months. So it has to trigger the fetches that you make um, to get the data back from FileMaker. It needs to know the date ranges you're interested in. And so um, this just does it. So the calendar boots up, that happens without any script. Once the calendar is done, it knows what date it's interested in. It then fetches to FileMaker and, uh, and it gets that, it calls a script which returns the results. And it just functions like it would be building any other web app. So the reason why this is important is that if you've got people on your team who are building web apps, they're going to be very, very familiar with how Fetch works. They're going to know it because it's core to what they do every single day. So once that's running, we'll just do NPM uh, um, start. And we'll open up this add-on folder here. Uh, and once this continue, once this bundles, still starting a development server. It took a while to install all that because of all the screen sharing going on. So there's our there's our data, and this is this is fetched from FileMaker. So this Jim, Joe, and Jane came as part of an asynchronous request from the web viewer to a FileMaker script that just handled the response back. I don't have to worry about doing that. So if you look at the script that gets called, there's a bunch of stuff in here that is just about managing the, um, managing the callback. But um, it, what it's doing is it's just making a da execute data API. So the other nice thing is, again, from within inside the widget, I can make a data API call just as if I was making it to the REST API call. Same exact structure. And I just pass it, I give it to this, to the, that fetch function and it will call this script. The script will produce its result. And at the end, it will call back to, to the, to the JavaScript and pass it back the result. It handles a lot of stuff. So you could be calling many, many functions. Like there could be lots of JavaScript functions firing. And this actually manages making sure that the right payload gets sent back to the right 
function call. So um, for people who, who use fetch, this is what you want. This is part of a library called FMW utils. It's available on NPM and it has the fetch function in it. And there's a sample file, which um, kind of goes through sort of how you use that. But um, I think that's uh, super important to, um, to understand. So we've, that, that, that fetch is really critical. The other thing in that utils file is, um, let me go pull that up real quick so you can see it. And by the way, these are all open source. There's GitHub repos. You can ask questions on the GitHub repos. You can suggest changes. You can do all those things. They're all there. So um, this has the docs. It talks about how to install it. You can install this right off of the CDN. So if you're just making a simple, a simple solution, you don't need to do a bundle or anything. You can just load it off a of CDN. You've got fetch as part of that utils. And um, we've got some examples in this. And we've got um, some generated API docs that cover the different things that are part of this. So I'm, I'm kind of over my time. So I'm going to stop there and just um, uh, ask for questions or comments or. Bob, was that the script you were referring to, the HTML um, code? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that, that, that last question. Was that the HTML code you were talking about before? You mentioned there was an HTML thing that you were putting in using the two calls. I'm not sure. Um, did anybody, anybody remembering what, what comment I said that? You, no, the HTML that we put in a field is the inline version of all oh, of yeah. the code that we write, including this package here, including what Todd is showing. So again, because of the constraints around, so what, what you end up with, if you build this way, we have, we have like, um, we have uh, support for internationalization in here. We have transpiling to IE 11. We have stuff for WebDirect. We have all this stuff that we needed to do to build stuff that worked across platforms. So it's more complicated than what you would need to get started just using JavaScript. But if you're using React, if you already know React, this is where you want to go because it just handles, abstracts away a whole bunch of stuff that will just make this super easy for you to do. Um, maybe something to show is what the payload ends up looking like that closes the loop for some folks at the uh maybe to say at the end of this process we have a function in here which goes uh, npm run build and this will um this will compile it'll take everything transpile it make it ready for ie 11 bundle in all the ie uh the internationalization do all that stuff and it'll create a single blob of html which um, was what gets put in that HTML field. Cool, thank you so about. much, Todd. That was definitely a deep dive as promised. Yeah. And, um, you know, thank so here you can, here's the, so here's what gets, oh, I didn't do the inline, but anyway, it produces a, a single giant blob of text, which is what gets delivered in that HTML. Um, so HTML can be, you can put millions of characters in an HTML page and it, it's fine, it doesn't care. It'll load them all in pretty much instantly. So um, I know that's pretty advanced for folks who've never done any React or never done any serious web development, but um, so we are building this, this stuff going forward and it's gonna be supported, continue to be supported. And um, you know, if, if you're into React, this is, uh, this is a great place to get started. If you don't care about React, still check out FMW Utils because the functions in there will help you do things like fetching and um, other stuff. Very cool. Thank you, Todd. And thanks, thank everybody. You, thanks for, you know, making all of this available uh, to the community and basically sort of being being our representative to Claris effectively seems like the role you're playing. Um, you know, yeah, thank you, Todd. Many, many times when we've wondered whether they were hearing us and uh, uh, there's no question that they are, you know. And, uh, yeah, they're definitely hearing. They're definitely hearing. Um, you know, there are folks um, really active in, in figuring out how to build the stuff correctly instead of just making a guess, which is kind of what they did for many years. Right. Um, and that's not the case anymore. So um, there are folks um, who are either working in a big project like we got to do or just casually. I mean, I worked casually with them for years. I go up to the wedge all the time and have meetings with them and talk about this stuff. And it's really nice to see them stepping it up and going to the next level. 
Um, one thing I wanted to show is, is uh, we do have a coupon for you guys if you want to buy any of our stuff. Um, 20% off. It's just FM disc 06 2020, all uppercase. Uh, and you can get, I've put some of our products. You probably all know the stuff that we do here. Um, but uh, if you haven't bought FM Perception or Barcode Creator or Auto or Ledger Link, here's your chance for 20% off. Great. Thanks very much. So I'm going to wrap up with a little case study uh, showing some stuff that's uh, not as uh, cutting edge or stuff that came out in FileMaker 18. Um, let's see, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Everybody seeing that? Everyone yep. seeing the screen? Yep. Okay. And um, so it's a, just a little case study about using some of the, uh, basically the data file operations that were introduced in FileMaker 18. And it's also the case study was about FileMaker server. So I was going to say Wim or Steven or, uh, you know, if I get anything wrong in the FileMaker server part, um, please feel free if you have additional information, feel free to, uh, to chime in. So um, basically the goal here was to deal with the stats.log file that FileMaker server produces and uh, basically get some meaning out of it. it. You know, it comes in, um, I'll show you in a second, just as a text file. We wanted to be able to analyze this for one particular case uh, where it was very heavy use of the server, a lot of users, a lot of activity, and we wanted to be able to see what was going on with it and also to be able to look back, um, you know, days or weeks to see trends, why are things happening at a certain time, and also, if we were in the middle of something going on, an episode where uh, users experiencing slowness or something like that, to be able to quickly see what's happening in the stats log. So for anyone who hasn't worked with it, this is the uh, stats.log file. It's basically a you know, very generic uh, tab delimited text file. A um, Couple of things to point out, you can set in the FileMaker server admin console how often it gets updated. You can see here we're updating every 30 seconds. So that's giving us uh, 2,880 records per day. Um, and also our timestamp is acting effectively as a unique ID. Every row here has a, you know, a, a different timestamp. Um, so that's gonna be useful a little bit down the road as we uh, get into the specific specifics. So there are uh, 18 data points that come in the stats.log file. Um, which you can see here. There are actually only three that we're particularly interested in for this, uh, this uh, solution. Um, obviously for different, different applications, um, you know, different, different pieces of data may be more or less relevant for you. So we're, we care about like how many users are in the system and then the elapsed time per call and the wait time per call. And so here's from the documentation. Elapsed time per call is basically saying how long does a particular call take to be processed? And now I don't actually have an exact definition and maybe Wim, you could chime in on what a call is, but I know that one operation that a user does, such as creating a record or committing a record, can generate many calls because there could be you know, an auto enter calc that fires, or there could be an index that's updated, or there could be a script trigger that's run. So each of those in turn, I believe, can generate multiple calls. So one operation could in theory um, uh, generate many calls to the server. Is that an accurate um, sort of summary, Wim? Uh, it, it certainly is, and uh, we don't have good information about how the breakdown of the of the units of work that, as we know them, the script steps and 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 finds manual finds these kinds of things. We don't have a good, solid um, base of knowledge on how those are broken down in calls. But but you have the gist. Any one of those operations can can and will result in in multiple of these calls. The closest that we have for information about calls is actually in the top call stats log, where the most expensive ones are listed. And their call, whatever their their, their call uh, type is, is listed there as well. So, right. And so the elapsed time. Thank you, Wim. So the elapsed time per call is telling us how long this call, whatever it is, takes, and it's in um, a millionth of a second. So a value of a million means one second. Um, and then there's the wait time per call, which is how long does it 
did the call have to wait before it was processed? So those two things I found historically, just, just looking at those values and looking at them in the admin console when we could see them in the admin console up till server 16, um, would often be a very good representation of what users were experiencing. So if you had high elapsed time per call and high wait time per call, it would uh, usually correlate pretty accurately with users experiencing slow performance. So, to analyze this, I created a file which would basically um, take in the data from the stats.log file and just represent it as a few uh, graphs. So this is a graph showing um, for the course of one day, you can see here we're looking at 2,880 records, this is from January 6th, the users and how many users were there were per, per basically time interval, which was 30 seconds um, every 30 seconds. You can see the arc of their day. Um, this is a company based here in California, but it has uh, an office on the East Coast. So you can see about, you know, 540, six o'clock our time starts to ramp up. And then, you know, it's more of the users are on the West Coast. So about nine o'clock in the morning, they're hitting their peak, which is in this, on this day, you know, about 90 users or so. Um, that's, on this day, there happened to be a, a server maintenance. So basically we dropped to zero around two o'clock and then it built back up. And so this is just a way you could flip through day by day and see effectively the arc of their usage. And um, just gives you a sense of the usage. Um, they don't have any uh, web direct or CWP clients, but since those are separate data points, you could see you know, a combination of all the clients or you could see um, just one particular type of client. And so the next thing is to look at the wait time per call over the same time period. And um, you can see like on this, day, it's, pretty, it's pretty, uh, pretty low level. We're dealing here on average with you know, 500, 250, something like that. Um, uh, microseconds, I think is the term. So the, the calls are happening very quickly. Um, the elapsed time per call is a bit higher just because the calls actually take, um, take time to be processed, but basically nothing's waiting. So the server is basically able to handle the calls as they're coming in and then process them in whatever time they take. What was interesting is as this week went on, you'll see as we get to Thursday, we're starting to experience a period here where we have a period of much higher wait time per call. And that it basically means that the server is not keeping up with all the calls that are coming in, or it's not processing them fast enough to be able to deal with the next calls that are coming in. One of the things you'll notice here is I'm limiting the y-axis. And the reason for that is because if you have, you know, a spike, what one call that goes up very high, um, and I'll change the y-axis here, um, it can make, ever push everything else down. So it was important to make the data meaningful to be able to adjust the y-axis and to be able to see things sort of in scale because you didn't want one or a few very high numbers making everything else look sort of insignificant. So I found 10,000 was a pretty good um, measure for being able to see. And there were definitely some performance issues that were happening. For example, if we look at a day like this, you could see that we had throughout the day sustained periods of wait time, high wait time per call, and that was correlating with, um, with performance issues. Um, now, not, this is not about getting into the specifics of this solution or you know, the server or whatever the case is, just showing you that this was what I was using this file for. Now, my only way to update this file was prior to, to, to version 18, was to dump all the data and then re-import it. So I had a script, and I'll run this here, where I basically delete all data and import the log file. Ask if I'm sure I want to do that. I will point it towards, um, so it's truncating table, which obviously was a, was a um, you know, big step forward in, in, uh, compared to having to delete all the records. And I, you can see here I have, you know, a couple hundred thousand records here but deleting that would have taken time. We're skipping that, but still, um, 
you'll notice here that I have to go all available because .log is not a recognized as a, as a file format that, that FileMaker wants to import as a text file. And then I get my field mapping and I go to import it. And this file is about 18 megabytes. Um, and you'll see it takes, you know, a fair amount of time to import, not a huge amount of time. But one of the things I found was that even just having this amount of delay in the process made it so that I was not doing it as often as I might have, I might have wanted to, especially if we were in the middle of something going on. And I said, oh, you know, let's see if things have changed in the last five minutes. Just having a minute or a couple of minute process to import the data was a drag and made me um, a do it less often. So let me bail out of that. Let me get a new file. And I'm going to show the solution I came up with using the, um, the new uh, steps that we got in FileMaker 18. Let me open that. And now, basically, exactly the same point we were at before we did that import. But instead, I'm going to run the new process. And you'll notice, first of all, that I'm, the .log file is recognized. And I'm, in fact, only showing log files. And it's telling me that only, you know, about 8,000 lines are going to be added. And in a very short amount of time, just those records were added. So that's obviously a much better experience. And it's actually taken me to the most recent records that were added, which was just from a few days uh, in March. So that's obviously a much better experience. And it means that you could run this and then 10 minutes later say, oh, I want to run it again and not pay that price of having to dump all the data and re-import all the data. So that was the basic solution. Um, the question is then obviously, how did I accomplish that? So the file operations, if you haven't uh, played with them yet, there are about eight of them or exactly eight of them. And you can see the six on the left, those are the ones that I actually used in this, um, in this solution. And the, the two at the right, uh, I didn't have a need for. And these file operations are used in conjunction. So for example, if you wanna read from a file, you first have to open the file. Or if you wanna to write to the file, again, you have to open it. Or if it's a new file, you have to create the file and then open it and then write to it. So, and then close it afterwards. So there, you know, you're gonna wind up using pretty much all of these operations. So the first thing I thought as I came to this is like, okay, I wanna open that log file that's in that folder or it's just on my desktop. Uh, about the open data file step is that you have to supply a path. You can't present a, you know, a dialogue to allow the user to choose the file. So that actually stumped me at first. I was like, huh, so how am I gonna get this file that's you know, gonna be in a random place? I'm not gonna know where that file was. So um, I realized that the, the solution to that was to be used the uh, insert file, which got you know, refreshed in FileMaker 16 to give us a lot of features like being able to limit to, to certain extensions, name the dialog, et cetera. So I was like, well, if I could insert the file into say a global container field, I could then export it uh, using export field contents to a known location, and then I could access it with the open file. So you're gonna see it's actually gonna be a series of steps, and I'm just gonna walk through, I'll get a summary along the way as I do them. So the first step was insert the file, let the user choose the file location. I'm gonna insert the log file into that global container. Then I'm gonna use export field contents to immediately write that container back out to the temp directory. But now it's going to be in a known location with a known name. So now I can use open data file because I know where my file is. And then there's this second issue here of the target. Pretty much all of the um, data file script steps have a target. And I was a little confused at first about what the target was. And it's basically sort of like the destination or where the thing you've just done goes or effectively the result. And it's different for different script steps. So when you open a file, the target is basically just the ID of the file you've opened. Um, because you might open multiple files and FileMaker needs a way to differentiate between the different files that you've got open. So it assigns an ID. I think it just starts at one. It gets reset every time you quit FileMaker from what I can see. 
And you can just stick that into a variable. You could also stick it into a field if you wanted. But in my case, I'm just sticking into a variable. And so now I can read, I've got the file open. I can read that from that file. And it's requiring, as you can see at the top, the file ID, which is the variable I just uh, mentioned. And then the amount, which I'm reading the whole file, but you could specify just some part of it. And then here the target is, well, where do you want to put the data that you're reading from this file? And one of the cool things is you can actually put that into a variable as well. So rather than having to read the data into a field, um, and you were talking about 18 megabytes of data, which then when you committed the record, all of that would have to be you know, sent back to the server. In this case, I'm just reading all of that data into a variable, which is just keeping it in memory, which is gonna make it obviously much faster. So reading the data, putting it in a variable. So again, we've gotten one more step here where we've got our data in a variable, 18 megabytes worth. Now it's just a matter of parsing through our data. I'm not going to go into any detail here, but this is where that timestamp came in. So I look at the existing records and I get to the last record and I say, okay, what's the timestamp of the last record? Now let me go find that timestamp value in the variable that holds all the new data or all the data that I've brought in, find that timestamp, and then just get everything after that timestamp. So Pretty standard FileMaker, you know, text parsing using the middle function effectively here. So now we've taken our variable that had all the data, and now we've got a second variable that just has the data that um, we're interested in bringing in. Now at this point, I could have looped through the um, that variable, creating records for you know each row in that data. Um, but since I was you know excited about playing with the new steps, I was like, well, what if I just write that back out to another file and then import it? And honestly, I have, I, you know, I could have done some testing, A-B testing to see, you know, which was faster or more efficient, but it was certainly easier to, um, to just write out a file and import it rather than um, loop through having to set each field, you know, uh, one by one. So the next step was to create a data file and again, you have to specify a path to the data file you're going to create. In this case, I'm doing it in the temp directory. You have to open the file. Um, one of the things when you create the file, it gives you the, um, yeah, you, have, you open the file and it gives you the ID. And then you write to the file, you supply that ID, and then you supply the data that you want to write. And again, that's in a variable. Um, it could be in a field as well. And the last step is importing the data, and it's just the standard import dialog. So you can see we've actually got you know, a bunch of steps. We're doing a lot of jumping through hoops effectively. We're taking the file, putting it in a container, exporting it, reading it, parsing it, writing it, importing. So there's a lot of sort of back and forth. But as you saw in the demonstration, it all happens pretty quickly, and um, it works very well. So anyhow, that's the... Um, my little case study for using FileMaker's data file operations. Any questions? Thank you, Jonathan. All right, so that officially concludes the meeting. We will leave the uh, Zoom open for, um, you know, five, 10, 15 minutes, depending on however long people want to hang out, they want to uh, talk, to share uh, about FileMaker or, or life in general. Um, but I want to thank, um, again, Wim and Todd for taking the time to uh, you know, educate us all this morning and share, share you know, information about FileMaker, FileMaker 19 and sort of where things are going. So a big round of applause for our presenters. And um, we'll just leave the, uh, leave the Zoom running for a little while. Hey, Barry, if you have it, I want to stop the recording at this point.